there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. You join me for part two in a series of four rebuttals in which I'm reviewing the 2021 annual meeting, an event for the top brass of Jehovah's Witnesses that took place on October 2nd, 2021. We pick up the action as governing body member David Splain continues his talk titled The Way of Holiness, I have so much to say about this talk. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Well, Babylon the Great fell in 1919, and then the way of holiness was opened for travelers. But Brother Russell died in 1916. Did he miss it? Did he miss the inauguration of the road? I don't think so. He didn't have a bird's eye view of the opening of the road. He had a heaven's eye view. Because Brother Russell and his associates who had finished their earthly course, and they were able to look down from the heavens. And can you imagine how excited they were when they saw the first travelers set foot on the way of holiness? It must have been very exciting for them, for them indeed. And it wouldn't be surprising if Brother Russell and his associates were firmly involved in the maintenance program of that way of holiness today. Because every good road needs ongoing maintenance. The way of holiness is open, but maintenance on that way of holiness goes on. And what's the goal? It's to make it as easy as possible for people to identify Babylon the Great and to leave Babylon the Great. That is the goal. We're watching David Splain talking at the 2021 annual meeting. His talk is titled The Way of Holiness, and it's just going from the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> from the disturbing to the downright laughable at this point. Wow. Apparently, Charles Taze Russell is looking down from heaven, or how did he put it? He didn't have a bird's eye view of the opening of the road. He had a heaven's eye. View. Charles Taze Russell has a heaven's eye view, bless him, with his beard and his big eyebrows, <laughs> or heavenly beard and heavenly eyebrows. There he is in heaven, bless him, looking down and being actively involved in the maintenance. Quite what that means isn't clarified. I guess it means that Charles Taze Russell isn't just proud of what the organization's been doing since he left us October 31st, 1916, Halloween. <laughs> he's not just proud, he's actively involved in what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing. There you go. So Charles Taze Russell, from beyond the grave, apparently, is not just a spectator for what the organization is doing, he is actively involved. But what we're hearing is David Splain again pushing this year, 1919. I recently did a video of unbiblical Jehovah's Witness teachings. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. 1919 was one of them. Because what's really interesting is, though you can sort of cobble together a very, very tenuous, sketchy argument for 1914 that doesn't stand up to any scrutiny. It's different with 1919. With 1919, there is not a single scripture that can in any way justify that particular year as being a year of significance. It's just something you have to take on faith. It's just a case of, this is the year that Joseph Rutherford and his associates were released from jail, therefore it's significant. And oh wait, we'd better come up with a scripture to vaguely point to in this regard. Oh, here's one about three and a half days. So, 19... <laughs> 1919 is three and a half days from 1918. That's literally what they do. It's absolutely shocking. But this is what's required of Jehovah's Witnesses to view 1919 as the year, not just that 
God's people were set free from enslavement to Babylon the Great. In other words, they were emancipated from false religious views and they could suddenly start believing with crystal clarity. It also just happened to be the year that Jesus Christ invisibly undertook an invisible investigation of all the world's religions and looking at all of them, oh, these are the ones, th this is the group that I want to make my faithful slave. And he chose Joseph Rutherford and his associates. And by some mysterious means that's never been fully explained, <laughs> the authority that he gave to Joseph Rutherford and his associates has just been transferred in some weird JW version of apostolic succession, which is a Catholic teaching, by the way. This mantle of power has just been mysteriously transferred without there being, again, any scripture to support it. It's all for a, a religion that claims to base its beliefs and theology on the Bible. It's amazing how little their theology actually is or can be supported by the Bible. And in this part of the talk, David Splain is trying to argue for 1919 as the year when it all started and God's faithful and discreet slave swung into action. Now just think of this. In 1919, Babylon the Great fell. But what else happened in 1919? What provision did Jehovah make for these people? The faithful and discreet slave was appointed in that same year. And the slave didn't waste any time to start producing literature that was going to make it easier for people to come into the truth. 1919, the slave is appointed. By 1921, you have a brand new publication, The Harp of God. And it was especially designed for beginners and to, to make it easy for people to study and read and come into the truth. And that was necessary because in 1921, there was a shortage of teachers, of, of publishers, who could conduct Bible studies with people. So you really needed something simple. And uh, comparatively speaking, that harp of God was simple. Now, there were very few publishers in those days, just a few thousand. But they were workers. They did a tremendous job. Do you realize that before the harp of God went out of print, almost six million copies in 22 languages had been circulated. So this is evidence that maintenance work on the way of holiness had begun right after the road opened. Well, I doubt that very many in this audience have come into the truth through the harp of God. Anybody here? I don't think so. What publication brought you into the truth? What publication helped you to identify the way of holiness? Was it, uh, the truth shall make you free? Let God be true? The truth that leads to eternal life? You can live forever? The knowledge book? Enjoy life forever? Teach us, what does the Bible teach us? Or is it our fine new publication? Enjoy life forever. All of these publications have been used to help people to break free from Babylon the Great. And this is proof positive that maintenance on the way of holiness is ongoing. Millions have already taken that road. And it's our hope that millions more will do so before the end of this system of things. And we wish them all safe travels. And safe travels to you, David Splane, off that platform. There he goes, bless him. Uh, getting all confused with his list of publications, mentioning Enjoy Life Forever twice. Enjoy Life Forever? Teach us? What does the Bible teach us? Or is it our fine new publication? Enjoy Life Forever. Yes, twice for emphasis there. Mind you, you can't really blame him because there are so many, aren't there? Down through the years, there have been so many publications necessitated by the passage of time and the failure of Armageddon to arrive that inevitably 
over 140 years of the organization's existence, you've needed to continue to come out with new publications. So I'm not surprised that he can't name them all coherently, but I am loving the fact, loving the fact that he's mentioned the harp of God. And the reason why is because, as many of you will notice in my videos, I sit in front of my Watchtower collection. And I can imagine lots of Jehovah's Witnesses who tune into my channel seeing these books and being confused as to why I have them, but also thinking, okay, you have the old publications, you have studies in the scriptures up there, you have some of the older Rutherford publications, that's the finished mystery, that's millions now living, will never die, that's the harp of God, the green one. Probably you can't see them. They're probably out of shot. Sorry, Tibor. <laughs> Tibor went into a panic there. You, you're pointing to something that's not showing up. Anyway, you have all of these older publications. So what? It's old light. We don't need to think about old publications because all we need to worry about is what's being taught now. And then along comes David Splain and torpedoes that entire logic. Because apparently it is relevant. Apparently Jehovah's Witnesses do need to think about the harp of God. Because it's all part of the highway of holiness. But I would just ask you, if you happen to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, what have we really learned just now from David Splain about the harp of God? I would argue that we've learned three things. Number one that it was published in 1921, number two, that it was simple, and number three, how many copies were printed. 1919, the slave is appointed. By 1921, you have a brand new publication, The Harp of God. So you really needed something simple. And uh, comparatively speaking, that Harp of God was simple. Do you realize that before the Harp of God went out of print, Almost six million copies in 22 languages had been circulated. That's it. That's apparently all we need to know about the harp of God. Its year of publication, the fact that it was simple, and the fact that almost six million copies were printed. Apparently those are the take-home details about this particular publication. What does this say? about David Splain's attitude towards the rank and file. How condescending, how demeaning. Why doesn't David Splain let us form our own conclusions about the harp of God? Why doesn't he make it available? He's just spouting off these facts and these details and these stats. At the same time, he's not letting people read the harp of god on jw.org yes you can find it on ebay yes you can find pdfs online not through watchtower if you do the digging but this isn't an organization that says you go and read the harp of god for yourself and draw your own conclusions as to whether this had some role in bible prophecy whether this was how did he put it so this is evidence that maintenance work on the way of holiness had begun right after the road opened. Well, I doubt that very many in this audience have come into the truth through the harp of God. Anybody here? I don't think so. Actually, David Splain, not only is the harp of God not evidence that maintenance work on the way of holiness had begun, but if Jehovah's Witnesses were to read the harp of God, I think it's more likely that it would get them out of the truth rather than bringing them in. That's how bad I think this publication is. And you're probably saying, Lloyd, what do you mean? What's in there? Allow me to read to you. So in my display cabinet, again, behind me, you can see I have there the harp of God. That's not the 1921 version. That's the 1927 version. Fortunately, I do have 
the 1921 version, it's a bit more faded, a bit less glamorous than the 1927 version because it's older. But this is the very book that he's talking about in my hands. So he talks about it being printed in 1921. It says in here, 1921. If I show you the inside cover, it says there 510,000 edition. And probably what you can also see is a subheading to the harp of God, proof conclusive that millions now living will never die. Isn't it interesting that David Splain doesn't read the full title? He just calls it the harp of God. He doesn't say the harp of God proved conclusive that millions now living will never die because the first, we've not, we're not even in the first paragraph. We're not even in the preface and already it's nonsense. Already it's making a prediction that turns out to be false because it's published in 1921 and it's saying millions now living will never die. They're dead, David Splain. <laughs> so I'm sure there are some people around who were born before 1921. I actually researched this. It's possible that there are over half a million on the planet who happen to be older than 100 in the year 2021, where we are now. But that's not millions. That's half of one million. So time, the passage of time, has proved that statement, proof conclusive that millions now living will never die, the passage of time has rendered that prediction to be a lie. And we haven't even started reading the book itself. Now, as you can see, it's rather a thick book. And <laughs> I know I'm going to lose subscribers if I start reading the whole damn thing. What I have done is I have selected some quotes for you. And this is where I'm going to make Tibor's life incredibly difficult. <laughs> because it's actually complicated for Tibor to show the scrolling quotes but he's going to have to do that a lot now, I'm afraid. Sorry, Tibor, watching this. You're going to hate me by the end of this. But yes, let's see. Now that we've been given such a huge build-up by none other than David Splain, let's see what all the fuss is about, shall we? And let's look at some of these quotes that I found for you. Page 12. God promised that greater light should come upon his word at the end of the age or end of the world, which means the social order of things. Since we have reached that time, we confidently look for more light and thus we find it. Remember, in the context of this being the newly appointed faithful slave, look at what they're saying here. We have all of the new light we need, because here we are at the end of the world. So look no further, folks. We have all the answers. We're your faithful... Actually, they don't say we're your faithful slave, as I'm going to come to, but they are certainly saying we have all of the knowledge, we have all of the new light that we need. That's an interesting, and you could argue, very bold and arrogant statement for them to be making right in the first few pages. Page 14. The name Jehovah means self-existing one. Hmm, that's interesting. I thought Jehovah means he causes to become. So, <laughs> and this is page 14. So in, in the first 14 pages, we've been told something that contradicts current understanding, the current teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you study in the Enjoy Life Forever book, which was mentioned twice by David Splain, um, this will not be in there. It says Jehovah means he causes to become in the current publications, but back then they thought it meant something different. Page 16, I'm just getting warmed up. Page 16, 
Wireless telegraphy and airships are modern discoveries, yet since they have been discovered, we find that God, through his holy prophets, foretold centuries ago the use of such inventions. <laughs> the railway train has been in use less than a hundred years, and yet the prophets of God many centuries ago gave a clear and particular description of the railway train and the manner of its operation, and prophesied that the same would be in vogue at the time of the end, at the time the Lord is making preparation for the establishment of his kingdom. And then it quotes Nahum 2 verses 3 to 6, which we will read, but first let's read Job 38 verse 35, which apparently predicts wireless telegraphy or for the sake of argument, let's just say radio. Job 38 verse 35. Can you send out lightning bolts? Will they come and say to you, here we are? Apparently, the <laughs> Apparently this was proof that 1921 was the end of the world because a Bible prophet predicted wireless telegraphy in these words faithful slave, by the way, let's remember. Nahum 2 verses 3 to 6, in predicting the train, the shields of his mighty men are dyed red, his warriors are dressed in crimson, the iron fittings of his war chariots flash like fire, in the day he prepares for battle, and the juniper spears are brandished, as you notice is the case on many trains. <laughs> The war chariots race madly through the streets. They rush up and down the public squares. They shine like burning torches and flash like lightning. He will summon his officers. They will stumble as they advance. They rush to her wall. They set up the barricade. The gates of the rivers will be opened and the palace will be dissolved. This apparently was the prophet Nahum predicting trains, and in turn, this is evidence that 1921 was, quote, the end of the world, or the last days. Faithful slave. Let's just quickly look at page 114. Tibor will, if he's gracious, show you artwork appearing on that page, depicting Jesus on the cross. So... Make of that what you will, ladies and gentlemen. This is all part of the highway of holiness, Jesus on the cross. Of course, nowadays, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus didn't die on a cross. He died on a stake. Page 188. In earthly buildings, there is no chief cornerstone, but in this building of God, there is a chief cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus, the top stone or chief cornerstone of a pyramid, oh dear, is itself a perfect pyramid. The other members of the body then must be built up into Christ to conform to that chief cornerstone which is illustrated by the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Oh, okay, so the Great Pyramid in Egypt has some role in explaining Bible prophecy. Gotcha. Page 228, the fulfillment of this prophecy fixes the beginning of the time of the end because the prophecy definitely so states. The campaign of the great warrior Napoleon Bonaparte <laughs> is clearly a fulfillment of this prophecy. They're talking about the King of the North prophecy, by the way, as reference to the historical facts concerning his campaign plainly show. The king of the south, mentioned in the prophecy, refers to Egypt. The king of the north means Great Britain, which was then an integral part of the Roman Empire. Yes, they had a completely different interpretation of the king of the north prophecy. These days, of course, they believe the king of the north is Russia, Back then, they believed Napoleon Bonaparte was somehow involved and Daniel was prophesying the Napoleonic Wars, which we'll actually touch on a bit later. Page 230. 
the prophet then was shown that the 1,260 years would mark the beginning of the time of the end of this beastly order. 1,260 years from AD 539 brings us to 1799. Another proof that 1799 definitely marks the beginning of the time of the end. Wow. The time of the end began in 1799. And notice how emphatic the language is. It's not a case of, well, maybe, maybe, just throwing this out there, you know. Maybe it was 1799. It's just a feeling we have. No, it's 1799 definitely marks the beginning of the time of the end. This, bear in mind, is supposed to be the faithful and discreet slave. Does this sound faithful and discreet, or as it's rendered in the King James Bible, the faithful and wise servant? There's nothing wise here, is there? There's, there's no wisdom here. It's just literally spewing out nonsense. And then reading further down, applying the same rule then of a day for a year, 1,335 days after 539 AD brings us to AD 1874, at which time, according to biblical chronology, the Lord's second presence is due. So the Lord's second presence, not 1914, but according to the faithful slave, circa 1921, the Lord's second presence began in 1874. Spiritual food at the proper time, I'm sure you would agree. Page 232. In 1799, the beastly power of Rome, predominated by the papal system, received a deadly wound. The people had been taught to believe in the divine right of kings to rule and the divine right of the clergy to dominate the conscience of the people. When Napoleon, oh there's Napoleon again, when Napoleon took the Pope a prisoner and carried him away to France, and when later he refused to permit the Pope to crown him as king, but put the crown on himself and treated the papal claimed authority with contempt, this began to open the eyes of the peoples of earth, kings as well as people, to the fact that papacy did not possess the divine right it claimed. So there's Napoleon again, who we've learned played a starring role in the King of the North prophecy, and it was his actions that help us to learn, according to the faithful slave, that 1799 was when the last days began, because, of course, it's a no-brainer if you think about it. It was in that year that Napoleon captured the Pope. It's a no-brainer. Page 234. In 1844, the telegraph was invented, and later the telephone. These instruments were first used with wires, and by electricity, messages were conveyed throughout the earth. But now, by later invention, wires are dispensed with and messages are flashed through the air by the use of instruments all over the earth. This great increase of knowledge and the tremendous running to and fro of the people in various parts of the earth, without question, there's the dogmatism again, without question is a fulfillment of the prophecy testifying as to the time of the end. These physical facts cannot be disputed and are sufficient to convince any reasonable mind that we have been in the time of the end since 1799. Note again, number one, the dogmatism and the arrogance and the assertiveness with which these things are said. And note as well the gaslighting. These physical facts cannot be disputed and are sufficient to convince any reasonable mind. In other words, if you have a reasonable mind, you're going to agree with us. If you don't agree with us, probably it's because 
you don't have a reasonable mind. They were at it all the way back in 1921. For a hundred years they've been gaslighting. For a hundred years they've been pulling these shady manipulation tactics. Infuriating, isn't it? Pages 234 through 235. It was in the year 1874, the date of our Lord's second presence, that the first labour organisation was created in the world. Oh, wow. From that time forward, there has been a marvellous increase of light, and the inventions and discoveries have been too numerous for us to mention all of them here, but mention is made of some of those that have come to light since 1874 as further evidence of the Lord's presence since that date, as follows. Adding machines, aeroplanes, aluminum, antiseptic surgery, artificial dyes, automatic couplers, (laughs) automobiles, barbed wire, bicycles, carborundum, cash registers, celluloid, Correspondence schools, cream separators, darkest Africa, disc plows, divine plan of the ages, dynamite, electric railways, electric welding, escalators, fireless cookers, gas engines, harvesting machines, illuminating gas, induction motors, linotypes. Oh, I'm going to leave it there nonsense isn't it utter utter drivel that they're coming out with and just the mere existence of these inventions or discoveries is apparently proof that 1874 saw the second presence of christ all from the faithful slave page 236 counting three and a half years from 1874 The time of his presence brings us to 1878. During the presence of the Lord from 1874 to 1878, he was making preparation for the harvest of the gospel age. The Jewish harvest covered a period of 40 years, ending in AD 73. We should expect, then, the general harvest of the gospel age to end in 1918. Just... (laughs) spitting out nonsense, and also, why does it take four years for Jesus to prepare the harvest? Isn't that kind of... (laughs) I mean, what's he doing for all that time? Why is it taking him so long, four whole years, to arrange something? Page 239. Without a doubt, Pastor Russell filled the office for which the Lord provided and about which he spoke and was therefore that wise and faithful servant ministering to the household of faith meet in due season. Wow, isn't that interesting? So in 1921, the faithful slave thought that the faithful slave was Charles Taze Russell. You just couldn't make it up, could you? It's just so obvious that they do not have the first clue what they're on about. They really thought that the scripture in Matthew 24, 45, the governing body's favourite verse, applied to Charles Taze Russell. Page 241, let's press on. The great work of the harvest, that is to say, the proclaiming of the second presence of the Lord and the gathering together of those who truly love his appearing, has been so remarkably fulfilled since 1874 that it is one of the most striking and conclusive proofs of the Lord's second presence. Again, notice the dogmatism. Notice the assertiveness. There's no, or maybe, you know, we're just, you know, we're just offering this as on a take it or leave it basis. They were adamant, weren't they? And again, what does this say? How can we remotely call this anything approaching faithful and discreet or faithful and wise? Page 244, his presence beginning in 1874, he has carried on his harvest work from 1878 forward, 
but has not interrupted the Gentile dominion until that dominion should end. The end of the Gentile rule, therefore, would mark necessarily the end of the present order. Therefore, the end of the world. We should expect, then, to find 1914 as the beginning of the end of the old world or order of government, and that this would take place during the presence of the Lord, he definitely stated. This is interesting because it fascinates me, this whole question of what were their beliefs back then? What were their beliefs a hundred years ago? How did they attempt to reconcile the obvious failure of the prediction surrounding 1914, bearing in mind that contrary to what it says in the publications, Charles Taze Russell taught that 1914 was the absolute limit for Armageddon. So what were they teaching after Charles Taze Russell? Well, here we see that effectively they'd come up with this explanation that amounted to a slow Armageddon. So in other words, this is the end of the world right now in 1921. It's been happening since 1914. It's just been happening very, very slowly and without fireballs. That is basically what the teaching was back then. They didn't have the same fireballs, ground ripped open, buildings falling down, idea of Armageddon that we have now. Instead, they felt that it would happen, or was happening, I should say, more gradually and more based on political uprisings and labour movements and the First World War. It was happening before their very eyes, just very slowly and without fireballs and lightning, essentially. And this becomes obvious as we read further on. Page 246 Literally, the kingdoms of earth are being broken in pieces and anyone who takes a map of Europe today and looks it over can see how completely this prophecy is now in course of fulfilment. Nearly all the kings of earth are gone and their kingdoms are broken in pieces and are being consumed. This is being done because the Lord is present, because the old world has ended and he is clearing away the unrighteous things to make way for his new and righteous government. Again, they thought Armageddon was happening then and exhibit A, well, just look at a map of Europe <laughs> and notice the fact that monarchies are no longer popular. That was their evidence. Just as they come up with evidence based on almost anything today. Oh, pandemic, evidence. Oh, close election results, evidence. They were doing the same trick back then. Oh, look at the map of Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different. Countries are breaking up. Monarchies are being dissolved. Therefore, we're in the last days. Or therefore, we're actually in the process of a very slow Armageddon. Same page, spilling over into page 247. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Literally did these scriptures have fulfilment in the years 1917, 1918 and 1919, the World War furnished the excuse for the worldwide persecution of humble and honest, faithful Christians. Same trick that they're pulling now, they were pulling in 1921. We're being persecuted, therefore we're something special. Therefore, this is the end. Page 249, Jesus furthermore said that the regathering of Israel to Palestine would be one of the most conclusive proofs of his presence and of the end of the world. A full discussion of this point, together with many other points concerning the end of the world, is set forth in detail in the above-mentioned booklet, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. Therein is shown conclusively that the prophecies have been fulfilled exactly on time, that Israel is now being regathered and is rebuilding Palestine, 
exactly as the Lord foretold. Apparently, Israel being established was proof of the end. And I find it interesting that they mention millions now living will never die. Here is my copy. Why didn't David Splain cite this for his evidence? Because 1919, the slave is supposedly chosen by Jesus. This was published not in 1921, but in 1920, the year after. Interesting he didn't mention this, probably because it wasn't simple. But this book points to 1925, and as we've seen here, to the establishment of Israel as being proof of the end. No wonder he glossed over this particular book. Pages 249 to 250. Why should anyone deceive himself by being induced to cease an investigation of this subject because some self-constituted wise one will say, you can never know when the Lord will come. Jesus himself said to his faithful followers, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. The clear inference here is that the watchers in due time would recognise the evidences of his presence, and recognising these, would rejoice. Suppose we admit, for the sake of the argument, that no man knows the day nor hour of the Lord's appearing, what difference does that make? The hour and the day have already passed. He is here. Astonishing if you think about it. What they're saying is, well, some might say, well, no one knows the day or hour, so there's no need to get excited. There's no need to get excited about certain dates or certain interpretations of prophecy. And their attitude as the faithful and discreet slave was, who cares about these people? What do they know? We're at that time now. And because we are at the relevant time, we know everything. We have all the answers. Astonishing arrogance. How can you objectively say that this was a special group when they're saying things like this? I'm going to try and make headway. Page 253. No one will attempt to gainsay the fact that just now in the year 1921, all the nations are in distress and the people in all branches of business, socially, politically and otherwise, are in perplexity and know not what to do. And men of earth who are engaged in business affairs are so fearful that their hearts are failing them not knowing which way to turn nor what to do. Exactly the same fear-mongering that we see today. Exactly the same. Oh, what other period in history is like the one we're in now, where people just don't know what's going on? People are so fearful. Page 333. The proof cited herein shows that the old world social and political order ended, again, this whole idea of 1914 being the end, and began to pass away in 1914, and that this will be completed in a few years <laughs> and righteousness fully established. This printed in 1921. Seeing then that we are at the end of the old order and the opening of the new, and that according to the scriptures, many must pass over to the new, it can be confidently announced that millions of people now living will never die because these being offered restitution blessings, the presumption must be indulged that many of them will accept and be obedient to the new order of things. False promise. It's a lie. It never happened. That's your faithful slave, folks. Pages 339 to 340. Because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the other faithful prophets described by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews are promised a better resurrection because of the statement of the prophets that they shall be princes or rulers in all the earth, it is to be expected that they will be the first ones raised under the terms of the new covenant 
Therefore, it is reasonable to expect them to be back on earth at the beginning of the restoration blessings. Hence, these faithful men may be expected on earth within the next few years. This was their belief regarding the ancient worthies, Abraham, Isaac, Moses. They believed that they would all magically appear and take on positions of authority, that this would be one of the fulfillments of prophecy. You know, you have Armageddon, you have this slow transition, this period of anarchy and unrest that eventually results in God's kingdom being established. They believed that these Bible characters <laughs> would pop into existence how on earth anyone would know that it was Abraham? Bear in mind he couldn't speak English or anything. You just have to take his word for it. But they believed that Abraham, for example, would materialize, would be resurrected, and would start ruling as part of this gradual Armageddon, this gradual transition. Page 341. Everyone then who believes God's word and who confidently expects the kingdom to bring blessings to mankind and who sees it now being established, should watch for the return of Abraham and the other faithful prophets and get into communication with them <laughs> as soon as possible after their return. Get into communication with Abraham <laughs> was the message in the spiritual food of 1921. Page 349. God has invited us to use our reasoning faculties and if we believe these great truths taught in the Bible, we can reach no other reasonable conclusion. Again, there's that gaslighting. If you're reasonable, you will accept our conclusions. It's only if you're unreasonable that you won't agree with us. Same kind of rhetoric, isn't it? Nowadays they say, honest-hearted ones accept our message. We can reach no other reasonable conclusion than that restitution is the great objective of God's plan relative to the human race and that restitution blessings are near because the kingdom of heaven is at hand even at the door. Let those who are cast down look up now. Let the sorrowful be glad. Let the sad hearts be comforted and the broken hearts be bound up. Lift up your heads and rejoice in the fact that the day of deliverance for mankind is at the door. I'll leave it there. I could read more. But what a stream, what a torrent of madness when you actually bother to read the book, The Harp of God. Something that David Splain, let's be honest, doesn't want Jehovah's Witnesses to do he just wants to be able to stand on the annual meeting platform and point to this book as being something relevant on the highway of holiness and just hope and pray that no one actually bothers to see for themselves what's in it. Because again, if they were to see, if they were to read, if the organisation were to be honest and transparent and put this material on their website which I happen to know, for reasons I can't divulge yet, I happen to know that they could do it like this if they wanted to. They could, if they wanted, put the harp of God on Watchtower Library, but they won't. And isn't it obvious why they won't? Same as with all of the other publications, same as with Millions Now Living, all of these crazy predictions from previous generations of the leadership only serve to prove how flawed and man-made this organization is and certainly anything but faithful, wise or discreet. The first group, those who have been selected to rule with Jesus in heaven. Are their names written in this book of life? According to Philippians 4.3, the answer is yes. But even though they have been anointed with Holy Spirit, they still need to remain faithful in order to have their names written permanently in this book. The second group, the great crowd of Armageddon survivors. Are the names of these faithful ones now written in the book of life? 
Yes. What about after they survive Armageddon? Will their names still be in the Book of Life? Yes. How do we know? At Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says that these sheep-like ones depart into everlasting life. But does that mean they are granted everlasting life at the beginning of the thousand-year reign? No. Revelation 7, 17 tells us that Jesus will guide them to springs of waters of life. So they don't immediately receive everlasting life. However, their names are written in the book of life, in pencil as it were. The third group, the goats who will be destroyed at Armageddon. Their names are not in the book of life. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 tells us, these very ones will undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting destruction. The same could be said of those who have deliberately sinned against the Holy Spirit. They too receive everlasting destruction, not everlasting life. So the first three groups are the anointed, the great crowd, and the goats. We're watching Governing Body member Jeffrey Jackson giving a talk at the 2021 annual meeting with the aid of visualizations. His talk has the theme, Are You There? There being the Book of Life. Jeffrey Jackson is using this talk to unveil new light regarding the Book of Life, which we will come to. And in his preamble, he's going through what the teachings are regarding all of the various groups. You'll notice he is separating people into various groups. Already we have three groups. There's going to be an extra two groups that he's going to talk about. But the first three groups, and bear in mind, these groups are supposed to encompass everyone. Well, not quite everyone. There are some exceptions, which I will come to. But pretty much everyone who has ever lived on the planet should fall into one of the groups that's being discussed in Jeffrey Jackson's talk. The first three, we've had the anointed, we've had the great crowd, and if you don't know much about Jehovah's Witnesses, this pretty much sums up the two groups you can aspire to as a Jehovah's Witness. Either you get to rule with Christ in heaven over a paradise earth, in which case you're one of the anointed, which conveniently includes the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> the governing body. Yes, Jeffrey Jackson, who's giving this talk, Tony Morris, Stephen Lett, Sam Hurd, etc. They're all part of the anointed, or so they believe. We're going to find out more in this annual meeting about what it takes to be one of the anointed or how we would know, how someone would know that they are in this group. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of Jehovah's Witnesses will by necessity need to be in the great crowd, the millions who are supposed to survive Armageddon. I say millions, specifically eight and a half million Jehovah's Witnesses provided they're deemed faithful, and that's not a given, <laughs> but eight and a half million Jehovah's Witnesses, let's say for the sake of argument, they survive Armageddon, they are the great crowd, and they get to help repopulate the paradise earth under the rulership of the anointed along with Jesus. So that's the first two groups. The third group Hopefully, Tibor can show us an overlay. The third group there is the goats. And I feel Jeffrey Jackson glossed over this group <laughs> quite significantly. Here's what Jeffrey Jackson said about the goats. The goats who will be destroyed at Armageddon. Their names are not in the Book of Life. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 tells us, these very ones will undergo the judicial punishment of 
everlasting destruction. That's it. That's all we get to hear about who the goats are. And bear in mind, he's going into quite a lot of detail about all of the other groups. But when it comes to the goats, it's just a case of, oh, well, these are the ones that get killed at Armageddon. Who gets killed at Armageddon? Jeffrey Jackson. Why are you glossing over this point? Why aren't you specifying in more detail who will be killed at Armageddon? Who doesn't make the cut? Who doesn't get to be in the great crowd of Armageddon survivors? I think it's because he knows it will sound bad. There's, there's no possible way to spin it that will make it sound positive. Essentially, you die at Armageddon for the crime of not being a Jehovah's Witness when Armageddon strikes. So if you're not a Jehovah's Witness now, your only chance of living in paradise is to die of whatever reason before Armageddon strikes, in which case you could get resurrected into the paradise as one of the unrighteous. And then you're in with a shot of somehow working your way to perfection and learning about what's needed uh, to gain eternal life. We're going to learn more about that in Jeffrey Jackson's talk. But if you are a non-Jehovah's Witness, when Armageddon strikes, you are toast. And I realise there will be some Jehovah's Witnesses watching this saying, oh, it's not that simple. You're oversimplifying here, you lying apostate. God would never just kill everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness. He's going to read their hearts. <laughs> He's going to potentially save people at Armageddon, even who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, based on their heart condition, not a Jehovah's Witness teaching. I would refer you to a recent Watchtower which says we need to help people understand how important it is for them to take their stand for Jehovah and his kingdom. This means trying to motivate people to make the truth their own by applying what they learn, dedicating their life to Jehovah and getting baptized. Only then will they survive Jehovah's day. You're only going to survive Jehovah's day if you're baptized. And that's what it said in the October 2019 Watchtower, a recent Watchtower on page 11. That's why Jeffrey Jackson isn't going into any detail about who the goats are. It's because this is one of the most repulsive teachings of the religion, and he doesn't want to look bad on the stage. He's got bigger fish to fry in his mind. He's going to be revealing some new light. He doesn't want to get drawn into the grislier aspects of the religion. He doesn't want to explain to his annual meeting audience or be seen admitting that he is representing a religion that literally says, follow us or die. If you don't join us, if you don't become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you are one of the goats, and you deserve to be slaughtered at Armageddon. The fourth group are the righteous who have died. These include some of our loved ones. Are their names written in the Book of Life? Yes. Revelation 17.8 tells us that this book has been in existence since the founding of the world. Jesus referred to Abel as living from the founding of the world so we can assume that his name was the first name written in that book. Since that time, millions of other righteous ones have had their names added to this book. Now, here's an important question. When these righteous ones died, were their names taken out of the book of life? No, they're still living in Jehovah's memory. Remember, Jesus said, that Jehovah is a God not of the dead, but of the living, for they are all living to him. The righteous will be restored to life here on earth with their names still written in the book of life. 
They did good things before they died. So that is why they will be part of the resurrection of the righteous ones. No doubt some of them will receive privileges, such as serving as princes in all the earth. So now we have Jeffrey Jackson's fourth group, the fourth out of five groups under consideration as to what happens to them. And again, these groups don't quite encompass everyone, but do encompass nearly everyone who has ever lived. There are exceptions. And one exception was hinted at in what Jeffrey Jackson just said about Abel. Jesus referred to Abel as living from the founding of the world. So we can assume that his name was the first name written in that book. So this raises the question, what about Abel's mum and dad? What about Adam and Eve? What group do they fall into? Well, there's an interesting Watchtower article, the Watchtower of 1965, March 15th which goes into more detail about who will be resurrected and who won't be resurrected. The article's entitled, Who Will Be Resurrected? Why? And it laboriously (laughs) explains, takes a long time, it laboriously explains why Adam and Eve won't be resurrected. So they're not included in what Jeffrey Jackson's talking about. There are others who don't fall neatly into Jeffrey Jackson's five groups. I'll come to these ones shortly, but essentially what Jeffrey Jackson is saying here is if you were a follower, if you were a worshipper of God, either from the founding of the world or right up to just before Armageddon and you die, don't worry, you're going to get resurrected into the paradise. Finally, let's talk about the resurrection of the unrighteous. For the most part, the unrighteous didn't have an opportunity to develop a relationship with Jehovah. They did not live righteous lives, so that's why they are called unrighteous. When these unrighteous ones are resurrected, are their names written in the book of life? No but their being resurrected gives them an opportunity to have their names eventually written in the book of life. These unrighteous ones will need a lot of help. In their former life, some of them practiced horrible, vile things. So they'll need to learn to live by Jehovah's standards. To accomplish this, God's kingdom will sponsor the greatest education program in all human history. Who will teach these unrighteous persons? Those who have their names written in pencil in the Book of Life, the great crowd and the resurrected righteous ones. How can these unrighteous ones have their names written in the Book of Life? They will need to develop a relationship with Jehovah and dedicate their lives to Him. But will all the unrighteous accept that opportunity? No. Remember, all these unrighteous ones will be under the careful watch of Jesus and his fellow judges. Isaiah 65, 20 tells us that those who refuse to accept this help will be removed. No one will be allowed to cause any ruin in the new world. So any who display a wicked attitude during the thousand years will be removed. So now we have the fifth and final group that Jeffrey Jackson wants us to think about, the unrighteous who get resurrected. And all of this, of course, is building up to his revealing of new light. He's sort of hinting at it already, but he's going to be explaining in more detail a little bit later on in his talk, how the teaching has changed. And spoiler alert, the teaching hasn't changed that much. (laughs) It's kind of hair-splitting as far as I'm concerned, for reasons I will come to. But there were some things I wanted to draw your attention to in what we've just heard. First of all, you'll have noticed where Jeffrey Jackson says, In their former life, 
Some of them practiced horrible, vile things. So they'll need to learn to live by Jehovah's standards. To accomplish this, God's kingdom will sponsor the greatest education program in all human history. In their former life, some have practiced vile things. Okay, how vile are we talking about? <laughs> because I can imagine quite a lot. I can imagine pretty vile things being done. And what this teaching says, and this isn't new, by the way, this has been the teaching for as long as I can remember. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that if you die before Armageddon, with very few exceptions, which I'll come to, you're pretty much going to be resurrected whatever happens. So you could die as a faithful Jehovah's Witness. You could be, for example, a big name in the organization. You could be an elder, a circuit overseer, someone who works at Bethel, a pioneer. Let's say you die as one of those people. You're going to get resurrected. You're going to receive the resurrection of the righteous, as we've just seen. But you could also be, for example, Genghis Khan, Vlad the Impaler, Adolf Hitler, and you're still going to receive a resurrection. I'm not joking. And I've looked into this. As far as I can tell, and by all means correct me, viewers, if I'm missing something, as far as I can tell, you can be that vile as a person and still get a resurrection the only thing that's going to stop you from getting a resurrection is, number one, if you were killed in Noah's flood or if you were directly executed by God or if you sin against the Spirit. Second Thessalonians 1.9 tells us, These very ones will undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting destruction. The same could be said of those who have deliberately sinned against the Holy Spirit. They too receive everlasting destruction, not everlasting life. And sinning against the Spirit doesn't mean, you know, committing genocide, murdering lots of people, doing heinous things on an incredible scale. Sinning against the Spirit means sinning against Christ disavowing Christ, disavowing Christian, the Christian faith, being an apostate. And what this means, of course, <laughs> is that I am somehow worse. And again, this is how I understand things. By all means, correct me if I'm wrong. But I, as an apostate who has turned my back on the Jehovah's Witness religion for conscientious reasons. I am worse than the likes of Vlad the Impaler, Genghis Khan, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler. They're going to get a resurrection, apparently, because how have they disavowed Jehovah's Witness teachings? Sinning against the Spirit is about having the opportunity to be a Jehovah's Witness and learning Jehovah's Witness beliefs and then rejecting them. Well, none of those characters have done that, so apparently they're going to be included. Again, to the extent that I can tell, they're going to be included in this resurrection of the unrighteous. But anyone watching this, including myself, who dares to turn their back on Jehovah's Witness teachings, having learned them, if you've become a Jehovah's Witness and been baptised as a Jehovah's Witness, and you conscientiously turn your back on the faith, you're worse than the worst of history. You're worse than people who have arranged holocausts, or have committed genocide, or who have done any number of unspeakable things isn't it if you think about it isn't it a completely bonkers theology that the worst of humanity get a second chance 
But if you dare to apostatize from Jehovah's Witnesses, you're worse than the worst of humanity. The other thing I wanted to draw to your attention was where Jeffrey Jackson says, But will all the unrighteous accept that opportunity? No. Remember, all these unrighteous ones will be under the careful watch of Jesus and his fellow judges. Isaiah 65, 20 tells us that those who refuse to accept this help will be removed. I love that word removed. It has a very kind of clinical gangster feel about it, doesn't it? Do you mean killed? <laughs> Do you mean executed? Do you mean hacked down in cold blood? I think that's what you mean, Jeffrey Jackson. But he puts this word in there, removed, to make it all sound okay. And all the while we're seeing these visuals, which Tibor will hopefully overlay, of apparently a Bee Gee um, <laughs> who's been included in the resurrection of the unrighteous, minus his uh, stage apparel. He's not in his denims anymore. He's in a white shirt and dark trousers. So this Bee Gee is included in the... <laughs> in the resurrection of the unrighteous. And he studies long and hard, it seems, all about what's involved in staying alive. <laughs> but he turns his back, unfortunately. He can't be doing with all of this nonsense about spending eternity worshipping and praising the perpetrator of the greatest act of genocide the universe will ever have seen. He turns his back on all that and hence he is removed. Well, what exactly does this look like, Jeffrey Jackson? I would like more new light on that. How does that work? So you're in paradise and you're the BG who's, <laughs> who's turned his back on staying alive and who doesn't want to come under the millennial government, the kingdom government. You know... Does someone kind of hunt you down? <laughs> Will there be like Grim Reapers in the paradise? Like assassins who are tasked with hunting down and removing those who are willfully unrighteous, who don't want to do what's required. How how does it work? Imagine that's your day job. Ima <laughs> Imagine... You're an assassin and it's your job to hunt these people down. Or do they just vanish? Do they just poof into thin air? If they just vanish, if they literally just dematerialize, you then have to ask the question, well, why the need for Armageddon and why the need for Noah's flood? If God can just make those who are utterly evil and therefore don't deserve a place in his arrangement just vanish... Why the need for all the theatre with Noah's Flood? Why the need for all the theatre with Armageddon? Which sort of implies that there will be some kind of Grim Reaper <laughs> role in the paradise. And at this point, yes, we're indulging in speculation, but isn't that the problem with the entire paradise stroke resurrection teaching that the more you think about it, the more it just completely unravels. And I've done a video about all the various problems with the paradise teaching. I guess we can add this BG situation, <laughs> this Grim Reaper situation to that list. How does that work? How do you get removed? I mean, what's going to happen with this BG? Is there going to be some kind of tragedy? <laughs> Is he going to be stricken by some kind of night fever? It's all very well for Jeffrey Jackson to, again, take us on this whistle-stop tour of the theology surrounding death and resurrection and what have you. But he's leaving out some pretty big details. And he's doing so, let's face it, because the whole thing is a farce. The whole thing is a made-up fantasy. And the thing with lying, the thing with made-up fantasies is that the more you drill down, the more you zero in on, like, the pixels of the reality, 
that's when it fragments because none of it makes sense. It's all just made up. So how can it make sense? And that's the whole problem with everything we're hearing. All of these five groups that we've been discussing, it's all based on a fantasy. It's all based on a lie. And that's why the more you drill down, the more you look into the fine details, the more it falls apart. Now, for a few moments, let's think about those verses in John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Up to now, we have understood Jesus' words to mean that the resurrected ones will do good things and some will do vile things after their resurrection. But notice there in verse 29, Jesus didn't say they will do these good things or they will practice vile things. He used the past tense, didn't he? Because he said they did good things and they practiced vile things. So this would indicate to us that these deeds or actions were committed by these ones prior to their death and before they would be resurrected. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Because no one's going to be allowed to practice vile things in the new world. So what did Jesus mean when he mentioned uh, these two factors? Well, for a start, we could say the righteous ones still, when they're resurrected, have their names written in the book of life. It's true, Romans chapter 6 verse 7 says that when someone dies, his sins are cancelled. But, take note of this, not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. So the righteous ones are resurrected into the new world and their names are still in the book of life. Because there we could say the word judgment is not referring to a condemnation. It's not referring to something that is totally negative. It's true, at times the word judgment can have that meaning. But in the context of these verses, it seems that Jesus is using the word judgment in a more neutral sense. So it means more an evaluation or a probation period. We're watching Governing Body member Jeffrey Jackson at the 2021 annual meeting giving the talk, Are You There? And he has just unveiled some new light regarding John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. I've gone over this multiple times because it's all a little bit complicated. And no matter how much I think about it, no matter how much I try and untangle what he's saying, I can't see this as being anything revelatory or any kind of huge deal. Ultimately, the outcome for the righteous and the unrighteous who are resurrected into paradise after Armageddon stays pretty much the same and you could argue both have more or less the same fate because they're resurrected into a situation where they need to be obedient or they're going to die. Which raises the question, why even talk about them in terms of two groups? If pretty much the same thing is happening, if neither group is guaranteed eternal life, What's the big deal? What's the difference? I've put together a chart or a visual, which Tibor will show you now if he's gracious. This is, as I understand it, what we've just been hearing from Jeffrey Jackson. The previous understanding of John chapter 5, verse 29, is that when Jesus was talking about those who did good things and those who practiced vile things, he was talking about things that they will do during or by the end of the thousand year reign, the outcome being that those who did good things and will continue to do good things will get eternal life, and those who practiced vile things will be executed either during or by the end of the thousand years. That was the previous understanding. The only thing that's changed 
is that these things, whether good or vile, are now supposed to have happened before their death and resurrection, the outcome being exactly the same for those who did good things, namely eternal life. The only slight difference, and it is a slight difference, is those who practiced vile things, instead of their execution being a certainty, they're on, as we've heard from Jeffrey Jackson, a probation period. <laughs> so there's a possibility that they could change their ways and get eternal life, whereas before, one way or the other, they were going to be executed. That, as far as I can understand it, is the new light. Wow. <laughs> it's taken the faithful slave over a hundred years to figure out that in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus was talking in the past tense. But notice there in verse 29, Jesus didn't say they will do these good things or they will practice vile things. He used the past tense, didn't he? Because he said they did good things and they practiced vile things. Why is this only being noticed now? It's, it's the same as when we had the new light about the locusts at, I think, the 2019 annual meeting, when David Splain divulged that for the first time they'd been able to read the verses in Joel in context and therefore had realised that the locusts in Joel were not the same as the locusts in Revelation. How come it's taken you a hundred years <laughs> to read a verse in context, and in this case, to read a verse and realize that Jesus is talking in the past tense? If it's so obvious, why only now? And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are told, oh, well, the faithful slave only realize the truth about verses when it's God's right time. Well, how is it in God's interests for them to be in the dark for over a hundred years on any important verse? How is it in God's interests for him to guide his organization by effectively lying to them and making them believe and print wrong information about a certain verse. The, mo the more you think about the whole New Light doctrine, the more it unravels. On this occasion, though, the New Light has only served to complicate matters. You'll have seen there Jeffrey Jackson rushing to address a conflict that has now opened up between John 5, 28 and 29, or the new understanding of John 5, 28 and 29, and the verse at Romans 6 verse 7. It's true, Romans chapter 6 verse 7 says that when someone dies, his sins are cancelled. But, take note of this, not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. Not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. Well, that's just word games, isn't it? I mean, let's look up Romans 6 verse 7. For the one who has died has been acquitted from his sin. When you die, your sins are acquitted. And yet here we're learning about two groups of people. Both groups have died and have been resurrected, but one group is being treated differently to the other group based on what they have or haven't done and what sins they have or haven't committed. If it's really true that when you die, you are acquitted from your sin, how can you have a double standard? How can you have one group with their names in the Book of Life in pencil and another group that's on probation? Jeffrey Jackson's solution is to play around with words and say, look, it's not about sin. It's about the record of faithfulness. Well, aren't we talking about the same thing? When we're talking about faithfulness, aren't we talking about the extent to which someone has either sinned or not sinned? Doesn't it all ultimately boil down to sin? So isn't it just word games to say, yes, 
God's view of the sin is the same, but he's focusing instead on the track record. It's just a hot mess, to be completely honest with you. And again, this is exactly the sort of thing you can expect when you just have lie upon lie upon lie. When everything is just a man-made fabrication, the more you discuss the details, the more the whole thing is going to unravel, and the more you have to come up with excuses, because when you change one thing, when you come up with a new understanding of something, all of a sudden something else doesn't make sense. All of a sudden you've opened up another problem that you've got to somehow account for and come up with some fob off some excuse to explain it away that's what jeffrey jackson's doing and having already uncovered one problem <laughs> with the new light at romans 6 verse 7 he's going to discuss another verse where there's a problem so looking at daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 it seems appropriate too that we adjust our understanding of this verse notice there it speaks about people waking up in the form of a resurrection. And this occurs after what's mentioned in verse 1, after the great crowd survived the great tribulation. So this obviously is talking about a literal resurrection of the righteous and unrighteous. But what does it mean when it mentions there in verse 2 that some will be raised to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt. What does that really mean? Well, when we notice that, we notice that it's a little different from what Jesus said in John chapter 5. He spoke about life and judgment. But now here it's talking about everlasting life and everlasting contempt. So that term everlasting helps us to realize that this is talking about the final outcome after these ones have had an opportunity to accept the education. So those who are resurrected, who make good use of this, this uh, education, well, they will continue on and ultimately receive everlasting life. But then on the other hand, any who refuse to accept the benefits of that uh, education, they will be judged as worthy of eternal destruction. Now, let's finally read Verse 3. And those having insight will shine as brightly as the expanse of heaven, and those bringing the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is speaking about the massive education work that will be done in the new world. The glorified anointed ones will shine brightly as they work closely with Jesus to direct the education work that will bring the many to righteousness. What a joy it will be for them to take part in this amazing work in their role as priests. They will assist with the healing of the nations. And what a privilege it will be to see obedient humans become free from the burden of sin and death and gain perfection. Of course, we have to realize that at that time on earth, there won't be just resurrected ones, will there? They'll be the survivors of Armageddon and any children that are born in the new world. These ones will ultimately attain to perfection. What a crowded planet it's going to be. Basically, everyone who has ever lived, with only a few exceptions, as I've mentioned previously, Pretty much everyone who's ever lived being brought back, whether they're good or bad, and as I've pointed out before, we're talking a hundred billion. On top of this, Jeffrey Jackson is hinting that there may be children born in the paradise. So we're now talking potentially over a hundred billion on our planet. I mean, do they not pay the slightest attention? to what's going on in terms of population and climate and that kind of thing and human impact on our ecosystem. They really think, with the Earth currently heaving with nearly 8 billion people, 
they really think our planet can sustain over a hundred billion people kicking about, pooping, <laughs> eating, using resources. They really think that's sustainable, do they? Again, they've just not given this any thought, have they? And what on earth was that nonsense about Daniel? But now here it's talking about everlasting life and everlasting contempt. So that term everlasting helps us to realize that this is talking about the final outcome after these ones have had an opportunity to accept the education. Yeah, it couldn't just be that your teachings don't make sense or, heaven forbid, that the Bible contradicts itself. No, it must be that we can put emphasis on certain words, in this case, everlasting. <laughs> because the word everlasting is used, we don't need to worry about the resurrection after Armageddon. We can kick it all into the long grass and say it's talking about the final outcome, what's going to happen after a thousand years when Satan is released. Because, and by the way, that never sat right with me as a Jehovah's Witness. Apparently, God's plan for saving mankind from evil involves getting rid of evil and binding Satan and his demons only to wait a thousand years... <laughs> and let Satan and his demons loose again. What a convoluted plan. Just get shut of the whole thing. Just get rid of evil. You're God. You have the power to do whatever you like. Just get rid of evil people. Why this bizarre pantomime where you're resurrecting everyone who's ever died and giving them a second chance, but this time on a massively overpopulated Earth, apparently their first life wasn't enough to decide whether they're good or bad. They need a second life in two groups, righteous and unrighteous, to decide whether they're good or bad. And it's not just about observing them during this thousand-year period. We need to test them. There needs to be some kind of exam <laughs> at the end which we're calling the final outcome when Satan needs to be unleashed. Satan is like God's attack dog who can just be unleashed as some kind of weird experiment to find out whether people are good or evil. The whole thing is so convoluted and so nonsensical, but at least it's giving us this ridiculous artwork. <laughs> I mean, good grief. Hopefully Tibor is by now showing the resurrected anointed smiling down on Paradise Earth. Isn't it interesting how they're all white dudes? <laughs> they're all basically Kenny Rogers clones. I mean, how do you explain this? How is it that anointed ones, whether they are men or women, and no matter their ethnicity when they go to heaven and start ruling with Jesus as the 144,000, automatically they become Kenny Rogers clones. <laughs> automatically they become white dudes with white hair. Why white hair? Why, why not, you know, brown, black or blonde hair? What's with the white hair? <laughs> it's... It's so ridiculous, isn't it? You know, we've, we've gone from the resurrected Bee Gee, who's decided to turn his back on staying alive, to, to a heaven full of Kenny Rogers, smiling down, knowing that the whole thing is going to descend into anarchy for a brief period, once the thousand years are ended and Satan is let loose. But this is the good news the majority of perfect mankind will find themselves passing the final test. Yes, and their names will be written permanently in the book of life. Isn't that exciting to think about what's going to happen in the future? Yes, now is the time Jehovah is preparing his people for this massive education work that is going to take place in the new world. So now's the time for each one of us 
to think about that question. Are you there? Is your name in the book of life? Yes, may your name be found written in Jehovah's book of life, and may it remain there forever. Well, we sincerely thank you, Brother Jackson, for that very upbuilding and strengthening talk. I have to say, when the governing body discussed that information, uh, all of us felt so um, heart, it was so heartwarming to think of the time when the anointed will really be able to work with people on the earth and help them come to perfection. What a wonderful, wonderful moment that will be. Yes, helping people come to perfection. <laughs> what a moment that will be. He, he just has to make it all about him, doesn't he? I'm sorry. Mark Sanderson here, using his position as chair to at almost every opportunity impress people with his position and impress people with the fact that he's on the governing body and he was part of this decision. He has to put that reminder in at the end. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't get as excited as Jeffrey Jackson and clearly Mark Sanderson are about this new light as we've already seen at its unveiling, if anything, it raises more questions than answers. What about that verse in Romans? How can you have two groups of people, both of whom have died and whose sins have therefore been acquitted, both being treated differently? One group having their name in the Book of Life in pencil or whatever, and the other being on probation. They're sort of a lesser group. Their sins have been acquitted, but they haven't quite been acquitted because it's all about your record of faithfulness, which, again, as far as I'm concerned, when we're talking about faithfulness, we're talking about what people have done and whether or not they've done good or bad things, bad things like sin. So it, it's all so silly, to be honest. And what a breath of fresh air it is when you can walk away from all this and not have to square the circle, not have to constantly try to force a square peg into a round hole and just realise that the Bible can be interpreted any which way, can't it? You can take any verse out of the Bible well, almost any verse, and make it mean any number of things. You can come up with any theology you like. And it just so happens that the theology that Jehovah's Witnesses have come up with regarding the resurrection and the paradise is so ridiculous that it completely fragments under even the mildest scrutiny. In the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus described the final judgment for sheep-like ones and goat-like ones during the Great Tribulation. As Jehovah's appointed judge and king, Jesus will be completely righteous in the judgment that he gives. As a thorough judge, he is already observing the actions, attitudes, and speech of all people, including how they treat his anointed brothers. By the start of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will have identified those who are sheep-like or goat-like in their conduct and attitude. From that time onward, those who are goat-like will not seek to change. However, those who are sheep-like and who have the hope of living forever on earth will need to remain faithful in order for Jehovah to keep their names in the book of life. Then, just before Armageddon, God's Son will pass final judgment on all those then living here on earth. Persons who are judged to be righteous will enter into everlasting life on earth. What a marvelous reward for those who keep their integrity. And let's again skirt over what happens to the unrighteous at Armageddon, shall we? Just as Jeffrey Jackson did in the previous talk, where he was talking about the goats. He very quickly skirted over it 
and didn't admit to his audience that Armageddon will kill non-Jehovah's Witnesses. Kenneth Cook's pulling the same trick here, or he's dodging the same elephant in the room. He doesn't want to admit to how doomsday and judgmental this religion is, so he's focusing just on the good bits, on the positives, on what's going to happen to those found righteous at Armageddon, namely Jehovah's Witnesses, rather than what's going to happen to everyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness, namely death and slaughter. This, by the way, is Kenneth Cook speaking in the talk titled Are You Heeding the Warnings? This talk at the 2021 annual meeting is following on from Jeffrey Jackson's talk where he's just unveiled some rather convoluted new light about John 5 verses 28 and 29 that, in my view, isn't really that significant. And Kenneth Cook apparently can't resist jumping up on the platform immediately afterwards and reminding the audience that last year he was the one delivering new light. He was the one coming up with an adjusted understanding about the sheep and goats, which, as I've pointed out, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, isn't really new light. It's really more of a flip-flop. So the organization went from thinking that the sheep and goats would be judged based on their behavior, based on their actions in the last days. That was the teaching under Rutherford. They wound up thinking that the sheep and goats would be judged based on what would happen either during the Great Tribulation or after the Great Tribulation. And they've come full circle. They're now back where they started and yes, the sheep and the goats are being judged based on what they're doing now, based on what people's record is in the here and now, in the build-up to Armageddon. You have to ask, how is this evidence of God's guidance? If God can guide his faithful slave to adopt one teaching and then to ditch that teaching and pretty much go back to where they were to begin with, it's not very efficient, is it? doesn't speak to any real wisdom. It's exactly what you would expect of a man-made, human-led religion that's just making it up as they go along. Let's briefly consider how anointed Christians are chosen. We'll start by looking at a lesson from ancient times. When the priesthood was established in ancient Israel, Jehovah decided who would serve as high priest as well as the underpriests at the tabernacle. Uh, Exodus 28.1 tells us that he selected Aaron along with his sons. No one could rightly question Jehovah's choice, and those chosen had to prove worthy of their calling. Similar to what he did back then, Jehovah chooses those who will serve as priests in heaven. He began by selecting Jesus to serve as high priest. Although Jesus was a perfect man, he did not choose that role for himself. We read at Hebrews 5 and verse 5 that the Christ did not glorify himself by becoming a high priest. Likewise, those who will serve as priests in heaven do not choose themselves for this assignment. They are selected by Jehovah and anointed with his Holy Spirit. He knows each one whom he has anointed for this service. How do faithful anointed ones view their heavenly calling? When a person is anointed by God, he or she knows without doubt that it is from Jehovah, and that one accepts Jehovah's choice with gratitude. Instead of feeling proud or haughty, anointed ones strive to imitate Jesus' example of humility. They're helped to do so by keeping in mind the lessons and warnings that are found in Jesus' parables for them. Kenneth Cook here, who, let's remember, identifies as one of the anointed, has decided to tackle the question, how are anointed Christians chosen? 
Let's briefly consider how anointed Christians are chosen. And if you strip away all of the fluff and all of the beating around the bush, this ultimately is the answer to that question. Those who will serve as priests in heaven do not choose themselves for this assignment. They are selected by Jehovah and anointed with his Holy Spirit. So the answer to the question, how are anointed ones like Kenneth Cook chosen, is Jehovah chooses them. Great. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much what everyone expected you to say, Kenneth Cook, as someone who considers himself to be one of only 144,000 who have ever lived in the history of our planet, who is worthy of ruling in heaven as a king priest with Jesus. Think about it. As I said earlier in this rebuttal, a hundred billion, it's estimated, have ever lived. A hundred billion. <laughs> and out of a hundred billion who have ever walked the earth, if we were to narrow it down to an elite, an elite of 144,000 who should rule over the planet forever, you're looking at one of them <laughs> in the form of Kenneth Cook. And we can trust Kenneth Cook because he's just told us that the decision wasn't made by him. <laughs> it was made by Jehovah. Well, that makes total sense. Case closed on that one. I think we can all agree. <laughs> There's no need to doubt God's judgment there. There's no need to, I don't know, ask for evidence or proof of this extraordinary claim that's being made that Kenneth Cook, this fine specimen, is among a tiny elite of everyone who has ever lived who is most suitable to rule in heaven with Jesus. This is the level of credulity that's needed when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You just have to watch Kenneth Cook saying all this and think, yeah, I trust you, you know, <laughs> seems legit. Why wouldn't God choose you, Kenneth Cook, to be one of only 144,000 who've ever lived, who get to rule in heaven with Jesus? You seem like a really great guy. And actually, when I think about it, it the same could be said of Stephen Lett, <laughs> Tony Morris, Samuel Hurd, Jeffrey Jackson, David Splain. They're all amazing specimens of humanity. And, you know, the more I think about it, <laughs> the more I could totally imagine that out of a hundred billion people who've ever lived, these are the ones who would be chosen <laughs> as being the elite, as being the ones most suited to rule over the planet. Well, thanks for clarifying that for us, Kenneth. Unfortunately, it doesn't make the whole thing any easier to believe and more to the point, you haven't told us anything new. This is already the nonsense Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to swallow. It's noteworthy, noteworthy that just before relating his parables, Jesus spoke about a faithful and discreet slave who would distribute spiritual food at the proper time during the last days. That slave pictures a small group of anointed Christian men today the governing body. For their faithful service, Jesus said that there would be a reward, but he also provided a warning. He spoke about what would happen if that slave ever lost sight of Jesus' future return and started to mistreat his fellow slaves. If that were to happen, that slave would be viewed as evil and would, as Matthew 24, 51 states, be punished with the greatest severity. Please note that Jesus was not prophesying that there would be an evil slave. This is a warning, not a prophecy. What was the warning? That the faithful slave needs to remain watchful. Yet it is not just the faithful and discreet slave who must remain watchful. By means of his parables, Jesus warned that all anointed ones 
must likewise prove to be discreet, faithful, and watchful. We're watching governing body member Kenneth Cook speaking at the 2021 annual meeting, his talk titled, Are You Heeding the Warnings? And he's going over the governing body's favourite scripture, the scripture that they feel gives them a mandate to rule, a mandate to control eight and a half million Jehovah's Witnesses. And isn't it interesting what Kenneth Cook has to say about the evil slave? Apparently, we don't need to worry about the governing body becoming the evil slave because... This is a warning, not a prophecy. This is a warning, not a prophecy. Well, thanks for clearing that up, Kenneth. <laughs> As someone who happens to be part of the governing body and therefore part of the faithful and discreet slave, we're being assured that the faithful slave hasn't turned evil and never could turn evil because this particular part of Jesus' parable is somehow less of a prophecy than what was said just a verse or so before, which makes no sense. I mean, let's look at the verse. Matthew 24, 45 to 50 who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. But if ever that evil slave says in his heart, my master is delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and in an hour that he does not know. Uh, who makes the decision and on what basis as to which part of what we've just read is or isn't a prophecy? It seems fairly obvious to me that the whole thing isn't a prophecy. The whole thing is a parable and you make yourself a faithful and discreet slave based on your actions, based on whether you're giving spiritual food at the proper time. In other words, in the context of, I guess, mainstream Christianity, you could apply this verse to almost any Christian, couldn't you? Which I guess is pretty much how most Christians view this verse. But Jehovah's Witnesses view it differently they say it's a prophecy, but they go one step further and say at a certain point it stops being a prophecy and just becomes a warning. This is a warning, not a prophecy. What was the warning? That the faithful slave needs to remain watchful. Actually, I don't think that was the warning, Kenneth. I think there was slightly more to it than that. You seem to be skipping over the part about he starts to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards. That's more than just not keeping on the watch. That's being abusive. And isn't it interesting that he's just glossed over that part? It's almost as though he is sort of aware of the fact that this organization can be called out on precisely what's described there because this is an abusive organization this is an organization where people are emotionally beaten through shunning people are ostracized families are torn apart this is an organization where people are failed where children are failed where children are put in incredible danger through written policies Policies that have been devised by the governing body and are being perpetuated and pushed by Kenneth Cook and his colleagues. I'm not surprised that he's glossing over this verse. I will just point out, however, the glaringly obvious, namely, that the interpretation here is completely arbitrary. You don't just say, oh, well, this part that's convenient for us, this part's a prophecy, the rest is just a warning. Either it's a prophecy or it isn't. And in my view, Jesus' words here in Matthew 24, 45 through 50 
are a parable, not a prophecy. But if you're going to make it a prophecy, own the whole thing. Don't just shrug off the bit that doesn't suit you because it calls out your abusive behavior. Truly, this is a time of judgment for all of God's people, including the righteous sheep who yearn to live forever on earth. But there is no reason for any of us to fear the final judgment that is yet ahead. Our loving Heavenly Father promises to give us power beyond what is normal, so that we may, as Luke 21 verse 36 says, succeed in standing before the Son of Man. So then, whether our hope is heavenly or earthly, we must heed the warnings found in Jesus' parables and thereby keep our names written in the book of life. Well, thank you so much, Brother Cook, for that excellent review of warnings that we need to keep in our minds. Well, did you capture all of the fine points of those three talks? We're now going to pass out the exam sheets. <laughs> no, just kidding. But if you would like to review those talks carefully, and we know you will, guess what? They are going to be presented to the Worldwide Brotherhood in the January monthly edition of JW Broadcasting. So you all will have the opportunity to carefully review your notes to make sure you got all the fine points in those wonderful, wonderful talks. As I mentioned at the beginning of this rebuttal, Mark Sanderson is really relishing his role as chairman. He's loving toying with the audience and acting all superior. I know something you don't know is his whole thing. And isn't it interesting what he has to say about this lag? Because how can it be that in an organization guided by God, where the teachings are so important that you have to accept them or be ousted as an apostate, how can it be that some people are in the know for three months and some people aren't? Because let's remember... This annual meeting took place on October 2nd, 2021. We're watching it now because Watchtower inadvertently leaked it. They put out a link because certain people were invited to attend the annual meeting virtually. So they received a streaming link. This link found its way to me and others, and we were able to capture the whole four hours, 15 minutes or whatever. We shouldn't be watching this. You shouldn't be watching this. It's only intended for broader consumption by the rank and file as of January 3rd, 2022, which is the first Monday in January, and therefore when the January JW Broadcasting will go out. So there's a three-month lag. You only get to know about this particular new light if you were in attendance or if you were lucky enough to receive the link from Watchtower. Otherwise, you're supposed to be in the dark for three months. How is that efficient? Either everybody needs to know this or it's not worth talking about if this is truly new light, if this is truly important and the organization has the means to let everyone know about it, which they do, why sit on it for three months would be my question. Why let only an elite know about this information? If I had to guess, I think it's because the organization wants there to be some kind of delay between the annual meeting and it being shown on JW.org, so that if there are any goof-ups, if anything is said that's really, really bad, that they didn't plan for someone to say, they have an opportunity to edit it out. That's the only reason I can think of. They want to have some kind of control over the material so that they can troubleshoot, so that they can paper over 
anything unfortunate that gets said. Yeah, that's the only reason I can think of. Otherwise, if you really take this seriously as new light, as spiritual food, why are there two classes of Jehovah's Witness? Why is there the audience at the annual meeting, the elite who gets to hear it, three months ahead of everyone else? And as to Kenneth Cook's stirring conclusion to his talk, what really stood out for me was where he said, But there is no reason for any of us to fear the final judgment that is yet ahead. Our loving Heavenly Father promises to give us power beyond what is normal, so that we may, as Luke 21 verse 36 says, succeed in standing before the Son of Man. Power beyond what is normal. Kenneth Cook here referring, of course, to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, which says, however, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the power beyond what is normal may be God's and not from us. And I've alluded to this sort of thinking before in my rebuttals. I think it's really sad and really distasteful the way this ideology is put across, namely that you're going to receive some kind of superhuman help if you're doing things right. And if you're struggling, if you're being tested beyond what you can bear, if you just can't cope for any reason, it's probably because you're not receiving the power beyond what is normal. It's probably because there's a problem with you. And therefore, watch out when the final judgment comes. I know that's not how he's spinning it, but that's ultimately what this is about, isn't it? The power beyond what is normal doesn't go to everyone. It only goes to those who are worthy. So if you're genuinely struggling, if you're feeling like, you know what, this is all just total nonsense. <laughs> I don't understand this. I don't recognize where this religion is going. And I can't keep up with these constantly revised teachings, these constantly adjusted understandings. What's intended is that you interpret this as your problem somehow. Somehow it's your fault because you're not receiving the power beyond what is normal. You're not being given that extra boost by God because you're just not faithful enough. You just haven't quite cut it. So it's a really toxic, narcissistic ideology, isn't it? I can imagine lots of people watching this thinking, how on earth could you believe this? I mean... This stuff's totally nonsense. It's completely nuts. It's all so arbitrary. It all amounts to just believe us, just have faith in what we're saying. What we're saying doesn't make sense, but you just have to believe us because God's chosen us. That's what it all boils down to. But when you're inside, when you're a believer, doubt and skepticism isn't a choice. It's just not on the table. You feel a genuine morbid dread of annihilation just for questioning anything. And you feel as though if you do have doubts, if you do struggle to square the circle, the problem is with you. Thanks to thinking like Kenneth Cook has alluded to here about the power beyond what is normal. Well, the governing body has asked that a brief update about the construction of the Ramapo headquarters facility be shared with you at this time. Now, despite the pandemic, we have clearly seen Jehovah's hand on the Ramapo project this year. So please enjoy the following visual update. Before the main project begins, Contractors have already been assisting to repair and strengthen an existing stone-faced bridge on the road into the site. When completed, the restoration of this structure will serve as a beautiful feature of the property. More important, Jehovah has greatly blessed the efforts to work through the planning process with the town of Ramapo. That process is now in the final stages of obtaining the necessary permits to start the large new construction project. 
In the first quarter of 2022, Jehovah willing, contractors will start clearing the site in preparation for earth moving, installation of underground utilities, and readying the locations where the first buildings will be constructed. This in itself will take many months, and we look to Jehovah to bless this key phase that when concluded, will open up the project for many volunteers to come and share in the work. Much forethought and work has gone into the arrangements needed for feeding, housing, and providing temporary office spaces for all such willing brothers and sisters. The design team is fully engaged in preparing the construction documents. The drawings for some buildings are well advanced. Others are in the concept stage. No doubt, seeing these concept images of the future Ramapo facility is exciting and encouraging to all of you. Well, with all of you, we continue to pray that Jehovah will bless this very exciting theocratic project. Yes, if you can, viewers, please do remember to keep the Ramapo project in your prayers. Only with your prayers can the Ramapo project be built. That's how this works. We need Jehovah's hand on this. We're watching a video that was shown at the annual meeting 2021 introduced there by Mark Sanderson, governing body member. And am I the only one who didn't really see Jehovah's hand as we were promised? Now, despite the pandemic, we have clearly seen Jehovah's hand on the Ramapo project this year. We have clearly seen Jehovah's hand on the Ramapo project this year. Wow. This I have to see. Tell us, Mark, specifically, how was Jehovah's hand seen on the Ramapo project? Jehovah has greatly blessed the efforts to work through the planning process with the town of Ramapo. That process is now in the final stages of obtaining the necessary permits to start the large new construction project. Oh, wow. Okay. So you've asked the Ramapo local council for planning permission and you've received planning permission and this is what was it clear evidence or clearly seeing jehovah's hand on the ramapo project you want to build something you've asked for permission to build something and you've been given permission to build that thing and that's the evidence. They're just not even trying anymore, are they, when it comes to this overuse of the phrase Jehovah's hand? I'm sorry, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You are making, Mark Sanderson, the extraordinary claim that the creator of the universe, the supreme Lord Almighty of the cosmos, is focusing his attention on a building project and intervening in Earth's affairs so that this project gets built. And your evidence, Exhibit A, for God doing this, is the fact that you've been granted planning permission. I'm sorry, it's just not persuasive, Mark. You'll have to do better than that. And as I've argued many times before on this channel, what does it say about God if what you're saying is true? What does it say about a God who would fold his arms through the Holocaust, who would allow millions of children to die every year, I think nine million children dying every year before they reach the age of five, people dying through starvation, people dying from the coronavirus, including, I hate to make this personal, your own father. God is sitting through all of this death, all of this misery, all of this tragedy. But when it comes to a building project, oh, I'll swoop in on this one. 
this is the one that deserves my attention. This is the one that deserves my intervention. It wouldn't get built any other way than if I influenced the decision-making of the Ramapo Town Council. Sorry, <laughs> I don't want to worship, would never want to worship, a God who is like that. It raises way more questions about God if we're going to grant you that what you're saying is true. And then we have mention of the need for volunteers. And we look to Jehovah to bless this key phase that when concluded, will open up the project for many volunteers to come and share in the work. It's funny that you should mention volunteers, Mark Sanderson. What happened to that video, Ramapo, Make Yourself Available, that I did a rebuttal to, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, I did a rebuttal to it because it briefly appeared on JW.org and then got pulled so that you can't go and watch it now, or the only way that you can watch it is via my rebuttal. What happened there? I'd love to have an answer. If you ask me, the reason why that video got pulled, which was, again, asking for volunteers, it was making clear how you would go about volunteering and what might be needed what sort of dedication might be needed. If you're going to ask me to hazard a guess as to why the video was pulled in the absence of any explanation from the organization, I think it might have something to do with these few seconds. Probably one of the hardest things that we had to do was find a home for our dog. We eventually found her at home with a beautiful family. Yeah, I can't imagine that went down very well among Jehovah's Witnesses who we know are already calling in and complaining about convention dramas that are too gory. It really wouldn't surprise me. And again, we don't have any confirmation because there's no explanation given. But it really wouldn't surprise me if there was serious pushback over that. Because what that video was saying was you should be willing to give up your dog for Jehovah to get something built. And when you think about it, isn't the entire Ramapo project emblematic of the greed of the organization and how they put themselves ahead of the needs of the rank and file so that the rank and file has to make sacrifices way above and beyond the sacrifices that are expected of Bethelites and specifically the governing body. Let's remember that this organization already has all of the tools it needs to make videos, to produce media. I can barely keep up <laughs> here on the Lloyd Evans channel with the torrent, the avalanche of cult propaganda that's currently being spewed out from Mount Ebo and from the existing infrastructure, from the existing resources that this organization has at its disposal. It works. The propaganda machine already works. But Ramapo, as far as I'm concerned, is just about convenience. It's just about the convenience of Bethelites and specifically, specifically, the convenience of the governing body. Because apparently Mount Ebo is, I think, 45 minutes drive away from Warwick. And they don't like the idea of some Bethelites having to commute that distance. So they want to move Ramapo closer to Warwick, which is where the governing body are. It's all about convenience, isn't it? If you're serving Jehovah as a Bethelite and as a governing body member, shouldn't you be willing to make some sacrifices in terms of your commute? You know, we're, we're watching videos that this organization's putting out talking about circuit overseers traveling for hours and hours to pick up media files so that they can return to a remote congregation that doesn't have electricity and or internet and show them videos. 
Those are the sorts of sacrifices, people walking for hours and hours and hours to get to a meeting, a meeting. And the governing body can't be bothered to do a 45-minute commute or whoever it is that's supposed to be involved. So the whole Ramapo project, as far as I'm concerned, is a perfect symbol of how it's one rule for the top brass for the elite, another rule for the rank and file. The elite needs to have everything that they want to make them comfortable. The rank and file have to make the sacrifices, have to be willing to turn their lives upside down if necessary, even to the extent of getting rid of their dog, just so the governing body and other Bethelites have an easier commute. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have felt Jehovah's loving care as we've received helpful direction just at the right time. Please listen and watch as those who work in the Coordinators Committee office recount how events unfolded with the pandemic and how Jehovah has guided matters throughout this time. In January of 2020, we started seeing news reports about a disease outbreak in Wuhan, China. Now at the time, it seemed localized and was not of global concern. But a short time later, the numbers were going up as the virus began to spread. Borders were closing and airports were shutting down. On January 22nd, the Coordinators Committee received their first letter from a branch about the coronavirus. The letter was from the Korea branch. Soon after that, we wrote to all branches in and around Asia and included guidelines on what to do if they had an outbreak in their territory. We had dealt with local epidemics before, but nothing like this on a worldwide scale. It was clear that the virus was going to affect almost every aspect of our theocratic operations. And during those first few months of 2020, the organization would be faced with a huge amount of decisions. You have to realize that this was catching us right in the middle of our activities. Our schedule for the whole year had already been planned. We had shepherding visits to branches, regional conventions, even special conventions. And now we had Gilead graduation and memorial coming up right in front of us. What were we going to do? Oh, that's easy. What you were going to do, Mark Sanderson, is put a doomsday spin on everything and use the pandemic as an opportunity to terrify Jehovah's Witnesses into thinking the end is near. What, what we're experiencing right now in this uh, global pandemic, I was telling the branch class yesterday, uh, it doesn't bother me. We've been waiting for this. We knew things like this were going to happen. Christ Jesus has prepared us. Where's the shock? So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. I should mention that we've just been watching a video segment on the organization's handling of the coronavirus pandemic that was shown at the annual meeting, the 2021 annual meeting, which was held on October 2nd. The organization seems really, really proud of the way they have dealt with the pandemic. As I've repeatedly said on this channel, to a degree their right to be pleased with themselves because I could certainly imagine the organization having a worse response. I mean, when you look at fundamentalist Christianity and fundamentalist movements around the world and the way they have responded to the pandemic, you know, engaging in denialism, COVID denialism, the anti-masker, anti-vax movement, Jehovah's Witnesses, by comparison, have actually been quite responsible in observing social distancing, in being very pro-vaccine. So the organization's response to the pandemic has largely been very good, and I'm grateful for that. 
because I genuinely worry about the plight of Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously more from the perspective of them being duped and exploited and misled and in some cases killed by being made to refuse blood or their children being put in danger through the organization's child safeguarding policies. I fear for the plight of Jehovah's Witnesses and I care about them. I live with Jehovah's Witnesses in my house my wife's parents are Jehovah's Witnesses and we live in the same building. And I was fearful at the start of the pandemic that the organisation would be irresponsible, the memorial was coming up, and I feared that they would view this as an opportunity to show how fanatical they were, uh, an opportunity to show observance of this important commemoration Oh, who cares about the pandemic? God's going to protect us. We should meet anyway. That could very easily have been their attitude. They didn't have that attitude, and I'm glad. However, do they deserve a medal for doing the right thing? And more to the point, is their handling of the pandemic proof, proof, that Jehovah is guiding the organization. That's the argument they are making in this whole segment. We're going to see anecdote after anecdote pointing the audience in that direction, steering the audience towards that conclusion. And I'm sorry, it's just not going to be convincing, at least not for me. The graduation of the 148th class of Gilead was in two weeks. Should we have guests come? Should there be a live audience? There was not much time to make these decisions. However, after prayer and discussion, the entire governing body decided not to have a live audience for the Gilead graduation that weekend. That was unheard of. The next thing we needed to figure out was whether to lock down headquarters at Bethel. I clearly remember it was a Friday night, March 13th. We were getting reports of COVID cases in the congregations around Bethel. And we also knew that the Bethelites would be going out to their congregation and other activities over the weekend. If we were going to do something, we needed to do it quickly. We called each member of the governing body and explained the situation. And all were unanimous that we should lock down Bethel immediately. So within the hour, a message went to the entire headquarters in United States Bethel family to stay in. And if you were out, to return to Bethel immediately. Sometime later, we learned that there were some COVID cases at Patterson. If we had moved ahead, potentially, we could have spread COVID through the whole Bethel family. We really felt Jehovah's protective hand. The same weekend as the Gilead graduation, the memorial invitation campaign was scheduled to begin. And so branches were asking, is it safe to go door to door and to distribute invitations? What if we can't meet in our kingdom halls? As the virus had spread in many countries, it became evident that we needed to suspend the public ministry. This was a very serious decision. But when we prayerfully analyzed the situation, we realized we would not be showing respect for the sanctity of life or love of neighbor if we continued house to house. Our preaching work shifted to letter writing and telephone witnessing. And what a huge witness has been given in this way. It was amazing to me personally when I saw how quickly the brothers could adapt to using Zoom, phone witnessing, letter writing, and instead of it being a, a huge setback for the work, it was almost as though the work even moved ahead. Again, we're being asked to believe that Jehovah's Witnesses were something special during the pandemic, a global pandemic that affected everyone. We were all impacted by it. All countries, all organizations, all companies, all religions, all impacted by this pandemic. 
and the audience at the annual meeting, and by extension, any Jehovah's Witnesses who end up watching this talk, which will presumably be millions of Jehovah's Witnesses, are all being expected to believe that the speed with which the organization responded to COVID-19, to the pandemic, is proof of Jehovah's hand. Well, the pandemic was declared on March 11th. And on March 11th, the NBA suspended its season. The football leagues in England reverted to zero spectator games. There's actually a Wikipedia page that gives you a timeline. I'll drop it in the description so you can see for yourself. You can see a timeline of all the action that was taken around the world by various governments and organizations in response to the pandemic. And the more you look at this, the more you realize there was really nothing special about the governing body's response. If anything, they were behind the curve. Or if they were ahead of the curve, if their response is proof of God's blessing, then what do we say about the NBA? What do we say about the soccer leagues in England? Google, I'm looking at the list now. On March 11th, Google asked staff in the United States and Canada to work from home to reduce the spread of COVID. And what were they just bragging about earlier? that on March 13th, Bethel went into lockdown. Google goes into lockdown on March 11th. <laughs> Bethel goes into lockdown on March 13th. But apparently Jehovah's hand was with Bethel. I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense. Again, it's one thing to rewrite history when you're talking about the murky past, when you're talking about events decades or even centuries ago that people either physically cannot remember or have difficulty remembering, but how dare they insult our intelligence by rewriting history as recent as the outbreak of the coronavirus, which we can all remember and which is so well documented on Wikipedia and elsewhere that when Tony Morris is making stupid claims like the following... Sometime later, we learned that there were some COVID cases at Patterson. If we had moved ahead, potentially, we could have spread COVID through the whole Bethel family. We really felt Jehovah's protective hand. We can look at those words coming out of Tony Morris's mouth and say, you fool, you bloated, arrogant charlatan. You are using a pandemic. You are using something that has killed millions, including over 20,000 of your own followers, of your own fellow believers, brothers and sisters, you're using it as currency. You're using it as some means of impressing people with your authority. Jehovah's hand, Jehovah's hand swooped to the rescue to protect you, to protect Bethelites who might have picked up COVID from someone at Patterson. That's what Jehovah's hand was busy doing on March 13th. Two days behind the curve, two days behind the NBA, behind Google, behind a whole other bunch of countries and organizations that took immediate action. And Tony Morris has the arrogance and stupidity, quite frankly, to stand in front of millions of people and say, we're special, we deserve special protection. Never mind the tens of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses who've died since the outbreak of the pandemic. What mattered, what really mattered, and where Jehovah's hand really needed to come to the rescue is in stopping us from getting coronavirus. As long as we survived, that was the main thing. Initially, some of the brothers were thinking, well, maybe we could just simply watch the pre-recorded meetings on JW Stream. Well... 
while that's an excellent provision, if we were going to do this for a long time, it would be wonderful to use a tool that would allow the brothers and sisters to come together virtually, to be able to interact and have that interchange of encouragement. We knew that a few branches had already started using Zoom for congregation meetings. And we wondered, could this tool be used for congregation meetings globally? So we asked those branches for their recommendations on how we could use this tool further. We got their comments, we did some testing, and then the governing body approved the global use of Zoom for meetings. We're watching the Jehovah's Witness organization, specifically the governing body, patting itself on the back for its handling of the coronavirus pandemic. In this case, the decision that it took to switch Jehovah's Witness meetings to Zoom. Apparently, Zoom was a tool that came to the rescue in helping Jehovah's organization, even though... <laughs> I can't believe I even need to say this. It's kind of glaringly obvious. Even though Zoom isn't a tool provided by Jehovah, Z Zoom is a worldly company, a worldly service. And the reason why subscriptions had to be bought by congregations is because they were having to pay another organization. If the organization itself already had at its disposal, its own version of Zoom that worked brilliantly, that was just as good as Zoom in every way, that still would not be proof that Jehovah's hand was guiding Jehovah's Witnesses through the COVID pandemic. It would be impressive, but the claim that's being made here of divine guidance of God himself helping the organisation weather the pandemic, it's just not being supported by the evidence. Yes, it's clever, isn't it? Zoom. But it's not coming from the governing body. It's not coming from Jehovah's Witnesses. They're literally leaning on a worldly invention and acknowledging that this worldly invention, and obviously there are alternatives like Skype and what have you, but let's face it, Zoom is sort of the go-to, but they're leaning on this worldly invention and using it as proof that Jehovah is steering the organization. Am I the only one, viewers? <laughs> or is their argument entirely unpersuasive? They're literally just pointing at anything at this point. They're pointing at anything that happened or any decision that needed to be made by the organization and saying, oh, well, we couldn't have made this decision without Jehovah's help. There's no way we could have, you know, figured out what to do <laughs> as grown adults, as leaders of an organization without divine help. All the while, other organizations around the world are just dealing with it, are just getting on with it. And... Also, it should be said, using Zoom themselves. Maybe not necessarily for religious meetings, although it wouldn't surprise me if other religions used Zoom as well. I haven't really researched that. But so what? You used Zoom. It's not proof of God's backing. To have the memorial without being able to meet together was so different for all of us. Can you imagine? For the 2021 memorial, there was an all-time peak of 21,367,603. Clearly, we have seen Jehovah's blessing on these arrangements. Have we, though, Tony? Is an all-time peak in the memorial attendance really proof of God's blessing, given that... Arguably, the 2020 memorial was the easiest to attend and millions of friends and relatives of Jehovah's Witnesses often feel compelled to attend the memorial, whether they want to attend or not, just to placate the Jehovah's Witness friends and relatives, just to keep them happy. Because what is it? It's sitting through a nonsensical meeting for an hour or so, you know, it's not, 
you're losing an hour of your time, but it's not a huge sacrifice just to put a smile on the face of a Jehovah's Witness friend or relative or work colleague, perhaps, who's been badgering you about it for weeks. And you're pointing to a peak in memorial attendance, which, again, the easiest memorial ever to attend. You're pointing to that as proof of God's blessing. Well, how do we interpret the fact that the organization dropped in numbers for 2020, for the 2020 service year? As I already mentioned, what? how do we interpret the fact that the organization shrank in average publishers by 0.6%, its first drop in publishers in 42 years. Is that proof of Jehovah's blessing? Quite clearly, what we're seeing here is cherry picking. It's cherry picking numbers that make the organization look good and ignoring numbers that make the organization look bad or that reflect poorly on the organization and I might add it's been fascinating to notice that in I think nearly a year now since those numbers were released we haven't had a single explanation offered for the dip in publishers I haven't seen anything in video or in print they just seem to want to pretend it didn't happen just leave it there, sitting there on the grand total sheet, unexplained and like and some kind of anomaly. Well, I think we're more than likely in for another dip in publishers because this is a figure, this 21 million, this is a figure from the 2021 service year, service report. If the publisher numbers had gone up during a pandemic, you can bet they would have led with that. You can bet they would have at least mentioned a rise in publishers during the annual meeting. I am willing to stick my neck out, and I'll admit if I end up getting this wrong, I'm willing to stick my neck out and say they had another decline in publishers in the 2021 report how else do you explain the fact that they're citing figures from the 2021 service report other than the average publisher figures? And, and they're trumpeting their memorial attendance as evidence of Jehovah's blessing while saying nothing at all about whether the organization grew, shrank, or stayed the same in numbers. While all these uh, new arrangements were being made at a rapid pace, uh, the usual work of the Coordinators Committee office didn't stop because of the pandemic. We still had to deal with the King of the North persecuting our brothers. We still had disasters and many other things to contend with. In fact, we handled twice as many disasters in the 2020 service year in the middle of the pandemic than we did in 2018. On a daily basis, we saw clear evidence that we are living in the last days. We had to come up with guidelines to help branches determine what aspects of relief work could be postponed, and at the same time ensure that urgent or necessary work went ahead safely. While there's no doubt that the pandemic complicated disaster relief efforts considerably, it was so faith-strengthening to see that the governing body refused to allow those complications to prevent them from caring for our brothers. In addition to the impact these disasters had on our brothers, in some countries, our brothers couldn't even get enough food for their daily needs. This could have been because of uh, government restrictions, supply issues, or other circumstances that wouldn't allow the brothers to work. Literally, the branches had to arrange to provide their daily bread. Branches were encouraged to establish disaster relief committees to care for the needs on a local level. Reminders were provided to help families try to prepare a reserve of food, if at all possible, in case the situation became worse. Apparently, the only way to get through a disaster is to be a Jehovah's Witness. If you're living anywhere in the world where there's a disaster, where there's an extreme weather event, where there's some kind of, I don't know, government coup or some kind of earthquake or whatever... If you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're toast. Because only in the Jehovah's Witness organization are people taken care of. That's the message I'm getting towards the end there. 
And I can speak a little bit about the response to disasters. And we'll come to whether they're proof of the last days, by the way. <laughs> but I can speak a little bit about the response to disasters because we heard there Todd Ellison of the Coordinators Committee office saying this. In some countries, our brothers couldn't even get enough food for their daily needs. This could have been because of uh, government restrictions, supply issues, or other circumstances that wouldn't allow the brothers to work. Literally, the branches had to arrange to provide their daily bread. I lived through a disaster involving Jehovah's Witnesses. Our house got hit by a six magnitude earthquake and we live with Jehovah's Witnesses. So we saw firsthand what happened. This was December of 2020. It may not have been the 2020 service year, but nevertheless, it was a disaster and the organization responded to it and we saw the way they responded. So I have firsthand experience of what happened or what has happened in a disaster where Jehovah's Witnesses are involved. And I can tell you, my wife's parents were not dependent on the organization. That's the message I'm picking up here. That if food hadn't been provided, if daily bread hadn't been provided, people would have starved. I think that's incredibly disingenuous to suggest that, at least based on my experience, where a disaster hit our part of Croatia, again, six magnitude earthquake, our area was bombarded with humanitarian support. In fact, me, my wife and my children were fleeing that same day that the earthquake struck and the line of traffic, we were expecting there to be a line of traffic out of our area. In fact, the line of traffic was coming into our area. The road was completely bumper to bumper traffic flooding into the Sisak Petrinya area because people from all parts of the country were responding to the disaster and were flooding in. In fact, they had <laughs> the problem that they had was that too many people were flooding into the area. That was hampering rescue efforts. Such was the response, such was the willingness from worldly people, people that Jehovah's Witnesses believe deserve to die at Armageddon, such was the response of worldly people that the roads were jammed and it was actually harder to get the people who needed help the help that they needed. But in terms of food, my in-laws were okay for food. They were fine for food, but they still had food brought for them. And you could say, well, that's something, that's brilliant. Yes, I suppose it's something, but again, it's not like they were dependent on it. It was more, if anything, dare I say, a token gesture. We want to be involved in this situation. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure there are many parts of the world where aid agencies aren't able to do as much. I'm sure I can envision situations where perhaps Jehovah's Witnesses have been more dependent on the organization for help. But I haven't seen that in our disaster, the disaster that affected our part of the world. And more to the point, I'm not sure how you can point to aid efforts by religious organisations as being anything special, as being proof that they're being used by God. Because then you have to apply the same rule, the same logic, to any aid agency or any religious charity. Frankly, so many of the charities that provide humanitarian support are religious. They're some denomination or other. And Jehovah's Witnesses are one of many doing this. But in this propaganda, this slick propaganda segment, they're trying to give this impression that everything hinges on them, and when a disaster strikes, it's Jehovah's Witnesses to the rescue. I'm sorry, 
they're just not as important in that situation as they're making out. And as I've repeatedly said, the aid is for believers. The aid is for followers. If a non-Jehovah's Witness receives this aid, it's coincidentally. The aid is primarily targeted at fellow believers. And how is that anything special? As the scriptures say, if you only show love among yourselves, you're only doing what the people of the nations are doing, or however it's said. However the verse goes, I've used these <laughs> scriptures so many times. There's also the verse, um, let your left hand not know what your right hand is doing. The scriptures will show up, will flash up on the screen if Tibor is gracious. I'm trying not to repeat myself, but they keep pushing these bad arguments. And another bad argument they're pushing on this particular occasion is the notion that Disasters are intensifying because we're in the last days. In fact, we handled twice as many disasters in the 2020 service year, in the middle of the pandemic, than we did in 2018. On a daily basis, we saw clear evidence that we are living in the last days. Chad, that's not evidence that we're living in the last days. Extreme weather events intensifying and increasing does not mean that we're on the cusp of an event that will lead to the world being ruled over by Stephen Lett, Tony Morris, David Splain and co. I'm sorry, have you never heard of climate change? I mean, just go on Wikipedia. If you go on the Wikipedia page, effects of climate change, there is a subheading, effects on weather, which reads as follows. Global warming leads to an increase in extreme weather events such as heat waves, droughts, cyclones, blizzards and rainstorms. Such events will continue to occur more often and with greater intensity. Scientists have not only determined that climate change is responsible for trends in weather patterns, some individual extreme weather events have also directly been attributed to climate change. Surely Chad knows this. He looks like a fairly switched on guy who must watch some news, I guess, even though he's working at world headquarters and I'm sure has a very suspicious outlook towards the media. Surely he's aware of climate change. And yet here he is using climate change, using intensifying weather events as an opportunity, exploiting these as an opportunity to peddle misinformation and to frankly fearmonger, to terrify people into thinking that the situation is different than it really is. And actually, the cyclones and hurricanes and tornadoes, they're really omens of the fact that Earth's rulership will soon pass over to the messianic kingdom and a toga-wearing Tony Morris, Stephen Lett, David Splain, Samuel Hurd and co are going to be riding around on horses, killing all non-Jehovah's Witnesses to pave the way for some kind of paradisaic utopia where everyone gets to mess around with pandas and eat watermelons. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing... The evidence for any of that, you're just leaping on calamity, quite frankly. And it's not just Chad. I'm not singling Chad out. He's just a mouthpiece for the organization he's working for. And quite frankly, he's probably been fed this script. But what does it say about an organization that does this? That just glosses over the fact that climate change is real and is affecting our weather glosses over all of that and uses extreme weather events that claim people's lives and cause death and misery, uses these as an opportunity to push their doomsday ideology. Of course, the virus affected not only our meetings at the Kingdom Hall, but also our circuit assemblies, regional conventions, and special conventions. So the governing body decided to cancel all live regional and special conventions 
for 2020. That led to a landmark convention program on JW.org that the entire brotherhood enjoyed. Well, once vaccinations became more prevalent, we faced another challenge. The United States branch was struggling to get vaccines for those in the Bethel family who wanted them. So in early April 2021, we called together a meeting. We had all the key individuals there from the various departments, and everyone was given an assignment. And within two weeks, we had enough vaccine to vaccinate everyone in the U.S. Bethel family who chose to be vaccinated. Well, about a week later, we sent a letter to all branches, encouraging them to investigate the availability of vaccines for special full-time servants. We were especially concerned about special full-time servants serving in lands where the government was not yet making vaccines available. After that direction went out, we had a tremendous response from a number of branches who were able to obtain vaccines for special full-time servants who wanted to receive them. Several branches said that it had seemed impossible to get vaccines in their country at that moment, but they prayed about it, they followed the direction, and then either that same day or the very next day, Jehovah opened the doors and suddenly they had the vaccine. All of these events occurred rapidly. And even though it was difficult to make so many adjustments in such a short period of time, we could see Jehovah's hand in the governing body's decisions. Television, radio, video conferencing have all served our brothers well, which just goes to show that Jehovah was guiding the governing body as they made these decisions so early in the pandemic. Does it though, John Ekron, does it show that? I'm sorry, am I missing something here? We're being shown this timeline, this coronavirus response timeline, that's exactly what you would expect of an organization struggling to cope with a pandemic. And here they're talking about vaccines. They were previously talking about Zoom. Zoom, a service provided by Satan's system of things. Vaccines a life-saving drug provided by Satan's system of things. Again, <laughs> I feel like I'm going crazy here. How are they taking the credit for those things? How are they pointing to those things and the availability of those things and the speed of availability of those things in the case of vaccines as being evidence that Jehovah was exclusively helping them. What do we then say about the 20,000 plus Jehovah's Witnesses who've died from COVID? What's the explanation there? If you're going to credit Jehovah's blessing, Jehovah's hand, for the positives, for things going right in the pandemic... What do you then say about Jehovah's hand and Jehovah's blessing when things go wrong, when things go tragically wrong to the point where people die? And let's remember, hate to make this personal, Mark Sanderson, but Mark Sanderson's own father died during the pandemic. We learned in the 2020 Always Rejoice convention. And speaking of that convention, we heard Stephen Lett there talking about how the decision to cancel the conventions was made on April 1st, or that's when the direction went out. As I said earlier in this rebuttal, the pandemic was declared on March 11th. And you have literally lists of organisations and countries around the world on Wikipedia on that date or in the following days making these same decisions more quickly. It takes Jehovah's organization three weeks, three weeks to decide maybe we shouldn't have conventions. Well, not maybe, we shouldn't have conventions, let's be clear. It takes them three weeks to make that decision. And that's evidence of Jehovah's hand. Again, I'm not seeing it. Viewers, can you see it? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just missing something here. 
But what I'm seeing is exactly the sort of timeline you would expect of a religious organization that is caught unawares by a deadly pandemic that the whole world is having to come to grips with and the whole world is having to make decisions and figure out how to navigate through this. And a big way, let's be clear, I realise there might be some watching this rebuttal who are anti-vaxxers. A big way we've been able to get through this pandemic, and it's not over yet, I realise, is through the development and availability of vaccines. And quite frankly, how dare this organisation try to take any kind of credit for vaccines being available. This being an organisation, let's remember, that dissuades people from higher education. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, if you're growing up in the Jehovah's Witness religion, you are literally dissuaded from going through college or university. You are literally dissuaded from aspiring to the sorts of professions, the sorts of roles in the scientific community that have led to the vaccines being available and lives being saved, including the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses. So for any organisation other than the organisations that have come up with the vaccines to be taking credit for the vaccines or for the availability of the vaccines is inappropriate and distasteful enough. But for this particular organisation that sets its face against higher education and higher learning that has resulted in the availability of these life-saving vaccines that have again saved the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses is absolutely disgraceful. You know, we've always appreciated the direction we receive from the faithful slave, but at that unique time especially, it was so encouraging to see Jehovah use them to make these major decisions and they made many that one week in March. Although there have been many challenges and sad times during the pandemic, it's been amazing to see many positive developments. So many inactive ones have returned. So many Bible studies have been started. We saw how Jehovah guided us through, decision by decision, step by step, and seeing how Jehovah led us through this situation has helped me to see that regardless of what is going to come up in the future, Jehovah is going to do the same thing. Like scriptures say, we, we, we get our plagues. Yeah, those times, but overall, when you're in Jehovah's arms, what's the worry? Uh, you could say every one of the governing bodies' faith was strengthened as we got through this trial, and it's just a continuous thing of our faith being built up and how Jehovah is directing us and he's preparing his people for life in that new world, the real life that's coming. It's been a real privilege to see Jehovah's Spirit in action during this pandemic. It strengthened our faith to see him use the governing body to provide scripturally based direction, keep the kingdom work going, and all the while showing respect for life. As a result, our trust in Jehovah's organization is stronger than ever before. And building this trust now is vital because Jehovah is preparing us for future events, including the Great Tribulation. Including the Great Tribulation. Yes, we've still got that to look forward to, folks. The coronavirus pandemic may have claimed millions of lives, may have resulted in all this upheaval, but you just wait until the Great Tribulation comes eventuating, of course, in Armageddon when there'll be worldwide carnage and it will make the coronavirus look like just a flash in the pan. Yeah, they're, they're all about pushing this doomsday rhetoric, aren't they? Isn't it bad enough that so many people have died from this pandemic? Again, including tens of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses and according to the organization's own admission, 
I saw this in a document. I'll actually show it on the screen if Tibor is gracious. According to the organization themselves, they have lost a disproportionate number of followers, of brothers and sisters to this pandemic. No explanation given as to why that is. So you're actually kind of more likely by their stats and according to them, you're statistically more likely for reasons unknown to die if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses compared to the general population. No reason given. And here they are talking about so many positive developments. We had a good memorial attendance. That makes everything okay. Inactive ones were returning. People were beside themselves in terror and fear, thinking it was Armageddon because they were still holding on to their indoctrination and these ones returned. Hallelujah. You know, that's their whole message. I'm sorry, I'm looking at this organization and I'm seeing nothing unique, nothing unique in the fact that a pandemic hit and they responded. And how distasteful of them to use this, again, as an opportunity to capitalize on it, as an opportunity to point to their authority. Isn't this what all this is about? The authority of the governing body. Mark Sanderson there going on about Jehovah guiding them decision by decision, step by step. We saw how Jehovah guided us through, decision by decision, step by step. I'm sorry, Mark, I'm just not seeing it. Again, the organization could have done far worse. I'm glad that they implemented social distancing. I'm glad that they used Zoom. I'm glad that they canceled the conventions and the memorial in person. I'm glad all of that happened, but they were just doing what they should have done. And quite frankly, it's not like they're doing the right thing in other areas. In areas like child safeguarding, for example, they're not doing the right thing there, are they? And you can sort of see why the coronavirus pandemic would be more of an urgent issue to a group of men who are aging and who may have pre-existing medical conditions. You can sort of understand why they might panic with this particular pathogen and do whatever is needed to play it safe. I'm sorry, that's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing self-preservation. And when we look at the stats, when we look at how the organization has fared in this pandemic. You can talk about memorial attendance all you like. You can flash your timeline on the screen and talk about how you felt like Jehovah was guiding your decisions. But ultimately, the organization shrank in terms of members. And by your own admission, Jehovah's Witnesses have been dying from coronavirus at a disproportionate rate. So how is the COVID-19 pandemic anything to brag about, especially to the extent of saying this proves that we're God's one and only true organisation? I also hope you noticed a distinct difference between the stage voice of the governing body when they were speaking in this segment and the normal voice. We talk all about Stephen Lett, don't we? And about the fact that he has such an odd way of talking. I feel this particular segment highlighted just how contrived, just how artificial his stage voice is, better than anything I've seen before. And frankly, he wasn't the only one putting on a bit of a voice. Our schedule for the whole year had already been planned. We had shepherding visits to branches, regional conventions. Seeing how Jehovah led us through this situation has helped me to see that regardless of what is going to come up in the future, Jehovah is going to do the same thing. There was an all-time peak of 21,367,603. We, we get our plagues, yeah, those times, but overall, when you're in Jehovah's arms, What's the worry? After prayer and discussion, the entire governing body decided 
not to have a live audience for the Gilead graduation that weekend. That was unheard of. Every one of the governing body's faith was strengthened as we got through this trial, and it's just a continuous thing of our faith being built up and how Jehovah is directing us, and He's preparing His people for life in that new world. Wasn't there a big difference there? Isn't it interesting? Granted, it's not as noticeable with Mark Sanderson. I actually think this comparison shows that he is actually quite a natural speaker out of all of the governing body members. I'm actually surprised, quite frankly, that they don't use him more because his stage voice is definitely closer to his normal voice, although there is still a difference. But then you move on to Tony Morris and it gets more noticeable, the drop, the, the voice just drops like an octave or whatever it is. When he's speaking sincerely, when he's speaking without a script and just saying what's on his mind. And then you get to Stephen Lett, and it's just a completely different voice, isn't it? A completely lower voice, a completely more sincere and compelling voice, quite frankly. I'm astonished that no one's tapping him on the shoulder and saying, you should be using that voice in all of your stuff, quite frankly, Brother Let. Why the stage voice? So we can hopefully put to bed this idea. Some people float all these theories about how he he's worked with deaf people and this voice that he uses is part of that. No, I'm sorry. I've spoken to his niece, Brandy Schmiedel. Thumbnail here, if Tibor is gracious. It's all a made-up, contrived stage voice that he's developed over the last few years. And what's interesting is no one has the bravery on the production team that was involved in this segment, this horrid segment, again, exploiting disaster, exploiting death and misery and plague to promote the organisation and to promote the power and authority of a small group of men. No one's had the bravery to say, hmm, maybe this shows that the whole thing is fake. Maybe by asking the governing body to deliver part of it on autocue or most of it on autocue, and then at the end to just open up and speak extemporaneously, maybe we've inadvertently showed that they're fake, that they're faking it, that the whole thing is an act. They're putting on an act to dupe people. I love the fact that this segment, as horrid as it is, at least drops a very strong hint in that direction. How has the direction to shelter in place affected circuit overseers, construction servants, field missionaries, and special pioneers? How have they been able to continue in their ministry serving Jehovah whole soul and with joy. What practical lessons have they learned? To follow the governing body's direction to shelter in place, we couldn't go in to see Steve's mother. She was in aged care, just 10 minutes away from where we're based. She died whilst we were sheltering in place. This led to another challenge, grieving in isolation. At the beginning of the shelter-in-place direction, I had a very difficult time. Uh, I had uh, flashbacks that were very difficult for me. During uh, the Vietnam War, I was imprisoned because of taking a neutral stand. I had a reaction to this lockdown of being confined. Fear of isolation is the biggest challenge for me. My lovely husband that I've been working with, with for years, helping build places of worship for Jehovah, was diagnosed of cancer and died after five months. We especially discerned the value of the direction in November 2020, when suddenly 
I was taken to the hospital because of a serious heart disease and severe pneumonia. It turned out that my life was in danger. The doctors evaluated that if I had contracted the coronavirus in that condition, I would not have had a chance to survive it. We're watching a video segment that's being shown about halfway through the 2021 annual meeting, which was on October 2nd, 2021. This video segment is praising the organization for its shelter in place program, which was applied to special full-time servants. So a special full-time servant is someone like a missionary or a circuit overseer or a special pioneer someone who reports directly to the organization. Whereas the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses fall under the authority and control of a congregation or a body of elders of a congregation, there are certain witnesses, including Bethelites, who report to the branch office. And this includes circuit overseers, special pioneers, missionaries. And what we're being asked to do is essentially believe that the shelter-in-place direction, basically social distancing direction that was given to people in this role, is evidence that Jehovah was backing the organization. And so far, I'm just not seeing it. I'm seeing some sad stories. I'm seeing some tragic stories. But sadness and tragedy affects everybody whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or not, and you've got to deal with it. I'm not seeing anything at all so far. Spoiler alert, there won't be anything in the rest of it either. But we're not seeing anything in this segment that points to the organization as having a unique grip on the pandemic. Being able to not meet an hour requirement, but go ahead and be very busy spiritually. And so we did a phenomenal amount of shepherding, strengthening, upbuilding our brothers and sisters, folks literally from around the world that we knew needed help. When the governing body removed the specific hour requirement, uh, I, I felt, I think we felt, their trust. That gave us more flexibility. And this enabled us to reach out to relatives not in the truth, and to support them during the pandemic. And that has led to two regular continuing Bible studies. I really feel how much the governing body cares for us every time they mention in their letters that they do not require us to reach the required hours. Many brothers and sisters today are depressed and experiencing pandemic fatigue. Usually, they need someone who they can talk to about their problems. And because of these adjustments, I now have more time to encourage them and help them to remain spiritually strong. This was a weird one. What we've just heard is about a minute or so of Jehovah's Witnesses who are special full-time servants, again, circuit overseers, special pioneers, etc., talking about how they're really glad they don't have an hour requirement. And this is something that you probably don't know if you've never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're just curious. Jehovah's Witnesses who commit to doing pioneering, whether it's as a regular pioneer or as an auxiliary pioneer or as a special pioneer, special pioneers have a lot of hours to do, I think circuit overseers have a, an hour requirement as well. You commit to doing a set amount of hours per month. When I was a regular pioneer, it was 70 hours per month, and it was 50 for auxiliary pioneers. I think that's still the case. In some instances, for auxiliary pioneers, it drops down to 30 hours per month. I think when there's a circuit overseer visit... For special pioneers, it's something insane, like 100 or so hours per month. I'd have to check. 90 to 100 hours per month. It will be on the screen, if Tibor is gracious, what the special pioneer hour requirement is. So <laughs> this has always been 
a weird element of the Jehovah's Witness religion. How do you justify this? How do you justify Christian worship, an act of Christian worship, being calculated and measured in hours? Is that really biblical? Is that something the Bible writers, Jesus, the apostles, would have had in mind? Oh, in the last days there's going to be a preaching work like never before, and we'll measure it <laughs> by timing how many hours people are doing. It's always been weird. It always niggled when I was a Jehovah's Witness. Of course, you go along with it because what alternative is there? And what's really interesting is when it gets dropped during a pandemic, all of a sudden they're talking about it as though, what a relief. When the governing body removed the specific hour requirement, uh, I, I felt, I think we felt, their trust. Does that mean you didn't feel their trust before? How are we supposed to interpret these words? They seem to be suggesting that the hour requirement is a bad thing. Well, what's going to happen when the hour requirement is reinstated? Maybe it already has been reinstated, I don't know. <laughs> but what then? It's such a telling part of this particular video segment. I'm frankly surprised they included it. I know why they've included it. It's because they want to make the governing body look really merciful and loving and understanding. But again, there'll be many Jehovah's Witnesses watching this, including many pioneers and many in full-time service, who will be thinking deep down, you know what, I really wouldn't complain if we got rid of our requirements completely. Our Christian life is compared to a race, and this is not a short race. There are unexpected things that can happen to us. By striving to obey from the heart now, we can be prepared to obey the directions that we are going to receive in the Great Tribulation. We are sure this is not the last time we have to be obedient. We see Bible prophecies being fulfilled right in front of our eyes, and ahead of us are even greater events that will bring larger trials. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 helps us, despite trials, to keep joy, deep joy in our hearts. And it ensures us that all difficult situations will help us to work on endurance. And this quality will help to cope with trials to come. I personally have benefited from following the governing body's direction. I've actually felt joy every day. And I can only put that down to the blessing from Jehovah God on our efforts to be obedient. We both benefited from the direction from the governing body because we trust they are the faithful and discreet slave Christ. Jesus is directing them. I am so absolutely grateful to the governing body for providing direction that is blessing every single one of us around the earth just like you. These dear ones have made great sacrifices to continue serving Jehovah whole soul during this pandemic. And no doubt we've all learned the value of applying the words of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be at it urgently, in favorable times and difficult times. For certainty, neither this pandemic nor any other difficult times to come will stop our preaching work and, more importantly, prevent Jehovah's loving care. We certainly express our love and appreciation to all of our special full-time servants in the field for the excellent example they've set in following direction. Yes, following direction. Isn't that what it's all about? Gosh. So thus ends 
the segment on special full-time servants and how they've apparently been richly blessed by following the direction to shelter in place in their various assignments. And really, all we've heard in those last few comments is, number one, just unabashed praising of the governing body, and number two, a repeated emphasis on obedience. By striving to obey from the heart now, we can be prepared to obey the directions that we are going to receive in the Great Tribulation. We are sure this is not the last time we have to be obedient. I've actually felt joy every day, and I can only put that down to the blessing from Jehovah God on our efforts to be obedient. Obedience, obedience, obedience. That's apparently what it's all about. You just have to accept the control and authority of the governing body. That's apparently the only way that you're going to navigate your way through a pandemic. Isn't that the message of pretty much the entire annual meeting? And isn't the annual meeting in and of itself just a massive rally for worshipping, worshipping the eight dudes on the governing body? I'm sorry, that's what we've just been seeing. Bear in mind, this segment on special full-time servants has been arranged for by the teaching committee of the governing body. This is everything that we've seen on this annual meeting is all they're doing and here they are arranging for special full-time servants from around the world to praise them publicly to give them thanks and appreciation how culty and if you take your belief seriously as a jehovah's witness how blasphemous isn't this the sort of thing that Moses got in trouble for, if you think about it. When the Israelites were about to arrive at the Promised Land, wasn't Moses sort of taken out of the equation because he attributed certain things to his own doing? He exhibited pride. He wanted the attention. He wanted the praise. Well, what are we seeing here? What have we seen in this entire annual meeting program? Just video after video, talk after talk, where the governing body are essentially praising themselves. But that's about all I have for you. Thus concludes part two of my thoughts on the 2021 annual meeting. Look out for parts three and four in the coming days right here on the Lloyd Evans channel. And thank you so much for watching.